So, like, okay. What are your guys, like, sleeping outfits? Oh, my God. What's wrong, Eve? My sleeping outfits? Just, just three friends hanging out, having fun. I don't want to know. I just don't want to know. <laughs> Why? Can I tell you my sleeping outfit? Cause no, Neve, guess Brian's sleeping outfit. Is there a whole routine to this? Yeah. It's called Brian's body experience. <laughs> Go on. Okay. I'm going to say... Fuck, this is hard, actually. I don't know. Cream just naked and some <laughs> kind of moisturizer and you just lie starfish in the bed. I can't sleep naked. I've, I've, I've done it once or twice. And when I do, it's really relaxing, but I get super cold. I used to be able to do it, but I can't do it anymore. Brian, what's Brian's sleeping experience? I need to know. I just sleep in my underpants. Really? That yeah. is so, Why did you make us guess? Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> That's but, so benign. But, I'm so annoyed. This is the thing. I change my underpants every 12 hours. I don't care. Why do we care? <laughs> Neve, we're just, we're just exploring. <laughs> Welcome to the Let's Fight a Boss video game podcast, the world's strongest video game podcast. I am sitting here with two of the most talented professional wrestlers in all of Japan. To my right, I have the once-in-a-lifetime talent, master of the moonsaults, it's Brian. Hey, everybody. To my left, I have the Stardust Genius, master of the Tranquilo. He went, to, he went to Mexico, he got really chilled out, he came back. We'll get into all that. It's Neve. Hi. Hi. And with you always, I'm your host, John. That's John. Uh, he likes Minerva Mink. That. <laughs> I've been saving that all day. <laughs> I have no understanding of that. You don't know who Minerva Mink is? No. Wow, you got a fucking you got a treat ahead of you later. She was the hot mink that was in the early seasons of Animaniacs, and they had to get rid of her because she was too risky, too risque. There was just model sheets of her in college, and it was like they were the most sexily drawn model sheets, and I was just I didn't understand why that was there. Yeah. Okay. Like, you know how John gives you a hard time for being almost a furry? What? <laughs> no! <laughs> well, let's just no, say let's just say that John's pointing the blame finger at you, <laughs> but he's got four other blame fingers. Well, three blame fingers and a big old blame thumb pointed right at his big old blame chin mouth. This is the worst episode I've ever done. It's not. It's fine. <laughs> Brian, tell us about Jumanji. Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle. It came out at the end of last year, start of this year. Stars The Rock, stars Jack Black, and some other people. It's pretty good. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, I, I was expecting, like, a complete shit show, and it's not a complete shit show. I've heard that. I've heard it's, it's, it's surprisingly acceptable. It's an above-passable, acceptable children's film, and... Like, it, it's one of those films where you're like, yeah, like, I'm fine with my kids watching this. There's enough in this that it's not, like, offensive or it's going to, like, age real bad. I don't know. So, you know the way, like, the original Jumanji was kind of fucked up? Yeah, it's one of the greatest films ever made. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I quite enjoy it. Is this one kind of fucked up? No. Oh. Okay. Um, I really like this film in that. Especially in 2018, it feels like a response to Sword Art Online and all the trapped <laughs> in the VR. I, I am. What a fucking <laughs> plot twist that sentence okay. was. Because, okay, because the film sets it up that it's about four teenagers who get trapped in a video game, but they're in the avatars of these jungle explorer adventure it's, types. It's like the sequel to one of the most beloved kids' movies of all time is a response to Sword Art Online. Yeah, honestly. It just kills me. It's really weird. <laughs> Um, and there are NPCs in this world, and they can only say like two sentences over and over again. It, it really feels like that's a, cool. That's it, it really feels like they know the RPG material, and they're leaning into it like real good. Mm. Yeah, and they do kind of like adapt into their avatars, and they use the strength and weaknesses of them, and they kind of learn some lessons along who, the way about does, their identities. Who does the girl turn into again? The sixteen-year-old blonde girl who's like. 
into Instagram selfies and all that. Like, that's her character. She's Jack Black. Right. So Jack Black. And, and who, then, who's the rock then? The, the shy, nerdy boy. Okay. And then uh, the big quarterback dude is like, Kevin Hart. I'd kind of like if the shy, nerdy boy turned into Jack Black and he was like, oh, wow, I transformed. Oh. <laughs> Uh, who's the girl? Who does she get transformed? Uh, that's Ruby Roundhouse is the character, but that's like the alternative girl who doesn't want to do gym and like answers back to people in this kind of education focus. So all of a sudden she's like like very early Lara Croft design with her bare midriff on, exposed and she hates it. Okay, so you know the way in things where you can like do a trope to subvert a trope? Yep. Does it actually do that or is it just presenting the tropes back again? It presents it back in, but there is this one bit where Jack Black's character, who is like a girl who's very comfortable in her body, who is now in the body of Jack Black, is teaching Karen Gillan's character, who is a model in real life, uh, how to like present yourself as an attractive woman. And it's really weird. But Jack Black plays like a 16-year-old girl super well. I would love if someone would teach me how to present myself as an attractive woman. Like, I feel like I could use that knowledge... I, 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 it's, it's, it's really cool how it's done. Like it, 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 it didn't feel cringy when they did it. Why does this have to be in a, a Jumanji movie, though? Like, there's a lot of the, the honestly that that's a question I had the whole time I was watching this film. Um, yeah, so there's a bunch of weird social trope things like that, uh, and there's some identity stuff that they sort of touch on and then don't, and then do, but then do not. But my biggest problem with this film, uh, and this, this, this is why I wouldn't really actually recommend it to people, is that there's no good animal set pieces. Huh. Like, you know how in the original film with the board game, I'd say there's about 20 turns turns in that game where they roll the dice and something fucked up happens. And it's, it's yeah. every time it's like, oh, fuck. Yeah, so you've got monkeys in the kitchen, stampede, lying on the piano. The spiders. Yeah, spiders. Fucking yeah. Yeah. yeah, you've got spiders, mosquitoes, yeah, yeah, yeah. quicksand. Uh, you've got the Venus flytrap. You've got the monsoon. In this film, you have a hippo at the start, some rhinos, uh, some... Yeah, I think there's some animals at the end. But honestly, most of the enemies in this game, because you're in a big jungle, are dirty beard men on motorbikes. Oh. Oh. And they fucking suck. I guess, like, with the whole video game theme, it makes more sense. But then you could do, like, a platformer where there is kind of, like, yeah. weird yeah. environmental Yeah, stuff. yeah, there's so Yeah, they could play into it. Yeah, that it, sucks. It, it really fucking sucks. And it's like, this should be, like, a big-budget film because it costs, like, $100 million to make. And there's very little animal CGI in this that's, film. That's really disappointing. Yeah, I, I was... I, I, I think that's why I don't think it's a great film. Yeah, maybe, like, an okay film. Yeah, a it's, it's, it's film. a very okay film. And, like, it, it, it's cool how they set it up and end it because the first 20 minutes are with the kids like it, it actually doesn't show the people on the poster until 20 minutes into the film and then for the last 15 minutes they're not in it again right right do you know what was way more fucked up than the Jumanji film the Jumanji cartoon yeah oh never watched it it was so fucked up yeah because like like it's Alan Parrish back in the Jumanji world but he's got the two kids with him yeah and so the kids like go into the jungle with him and it was really like Okay, so there's this episode where, you know the hunter from the film? Mm-hmm. They Van meet Pelt. Him. Yeah, Van Pelt. They meet him and they kill him. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. But then Alan starts becoming Van Pelt and he starts acting really fucked up. And it's really, like, upsetting because, like, he keeps getting, like, an urge to, like, shoot the kids and stuff. And it's, like, it's not cool. And there's this shopkeeper... And he only ever sells you, like, fucked up stuff. But he's like a Jumanji demon, you know? And so, like, he's kind of there as their sort of ally, but he's not. He's terrifying. I must... I, I want to try and download this and watch some episodes again. Because from what I remember, it was like... There was a kind of cruelty to this show. Like, But I think there was a cruelty to the original Jumanji yeah, no, as t- well. Yeah, yeah, was, yeah. It's yeah. like... It's weird to say it's a pity the cruelty is missing from J- New Jumanji, but there's something real about it. I, I don't know. There's something so cool about, I guess, cruelty. And ki- there's a Care Bears film, the one where they go to like the theme park. Yeah, that's really fucked up. There's a cruelty to that film, and it's great. Children's media doing that is always so much more effective. Yeah. Because like, you're not going to do anything 
hideously violent. It's, like it's all they're pulling their punches on all the surface level stuff, but like beneath that, there's something more. Like there's something weird. It's like they're attacking you in a way you, you can't really understand. It's great. Yeah. There's a greater horror to watching something and being like, oh, something is off about this. I don't know what it is. Than just seeing something horrible happen. Totally, hundred um, percent. Can we just go back to Van Pell for a second? Sure. Okay, because the way he's okay. So, like in this reboot or or the sequel, I guess they have a Van Pelt, but he's a different guy. He's played by Bobby Cannavale, who usually plays bad guys, but he, he's really really lame in this film. But I love the original Van Pelt from the Robin Williams film because the way it's done is that. You, you know, at the start of Jumanji, it takes place in like the 50s or 60s with Alan as a kid. And his dad is this, and he's wearing like a tuxedo because he's going to a some night event, some party. And he's just this really unloving, dismissive father. But Van Pelt, it's the same actor playing the hunter. And it's, it's just super fucking psychological. All in all, sounds pretty decent. It's kind of a shame they haven't like... Yeah. They haven't, like, I guess, retained... Although that, what you just mentioned, sounds a little fucked up. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, but this is in the original film. Oh, the original. Uh, oh. Well. Wait. Van Pelt? Weird. Wait, what? Yeah. Van Pelt was the dad? Yeah, same actor. Because it uh, was... Yeah, that, that, that adds that. a whole <laughs> other layer. Yeah, because it was his abusive father or his, like... Imagining that his father was abusive because his father actually wasn't abusive. That's so fucked up. It's just that he was scared of his dad, so the hunter in the Jumanji game was his dad. That's amazing. But it, it, it was a completely different costume and makeup. A film with layers, everybody. Sorry we got there so slowly. Yeah, yeah I'm sure Dear Listener got there quicker. Uh, no, no, like, Jumanji is one of the best films ever made. I agree. Apparently. The, the bit where the kid is growing the tail and he has to get his pants ripped always stays with me because I was like, oh man, that would suck. Because yeah. you were like, oh, I want to be a furry. Yeah, yeah, he's crying. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> he's just like... <laughs> Oh, and there's crying. a really and, and, and there's a really really good visual gag where like he has to run and get an axe, but it's in the shed. So he goes to the shed, but it's locked, and he's like shaking it. So then he grabs the axe to chop the door down, and then he looks at his hands and <laughs> realizes he has the axe and runs back. <laughs> That's really good. It's one that it's, honestly everyone should watch Jumanji. It's yeah, our loot drop. Would, it's, it's it's our big collective loot drop for the week. I don't want to watch that again. No. If we ever, if we ever, if we ever do a film club. It's going to be first. In the- <laughs> That'd be fucking great, wouldn't it? Yeah. Hmm. We'll talk. We'll talk. Yeah, let's do this. Brian. Yeah. Tell me about the Queer Eye for the Straight Guy reboot. Yeah. This is on Netflix. I think it showed up uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, but my girlfriend and I watched a lot of it uh, this month, and I absolutely love it. I'm really, really enjoying it, and they've been commissioned for a season two. Um, but it's really cool because the first season all takes place in Atlanta, Georgia, and then season two is going to take place in Cincinnati, Ohio, because uh, the original series mainly took place in New York. They do a couple specials in like LA and stuff like that. Um, were you guys fans of Queer Eye for the Straight Guy? Never watched it. No. Um, yeah, I watched the the original one. That's like that's like fifteen years old now. Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, no, it, it's just really cool to see it back, but like. The idea of this show is that it's the Fab Five, these five gay guys, and they help a straight guy out for the week by just sorting out his life. And they teach him how to like cook some nice meals, and they redesign his apartment or his house, and they'll teach him grooming and just, you know, just better etiquette. And then they sit back and they watch, and it's always very, very satisfying. Uh, but I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm just, it's really cool. I really, really, really like the gang that they have assembled for it. You showed me one of them earlier. Beautiful Caramel. man. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful man. Um, it's cool because, because they're all in their like mid to late thirties as well. Um, I, I think it'd be different if they were like in their early twenties, but because they're just like very much well established. And I think a lot of them have backgrounds on other reality TV shows or they're kind of like co-hosts of like his, his like shows like shows on the history his, his history channel mm. things like that like i think one guy was on like the second season of uh, the real world on MTV so okay forgive my ignorance here yeah what are they teaching this guy to do is it like just take better care of himself yeah so like 
They'll go to his apartment and it'll be like a complete shithole. Oh, dear. And he'll have all this clutter and he's like hoarding or something like that. So they'll get rid of all that stuff and they'll find out like what 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 uh, stuff he likes like maybe he's into films or something so then they'll optimize his apartment so he has like frame film posters that's really nice yeah and they'll do like a facial care routine with him uh, i love those bits uh, it sounds a little bit like hoarders yeah it well, kind like, of, it, it, it's a reality tv makeover show the only, yeah. the, only, the, only, the only thing with hoarders is i thought hoarders maybe got a bit too real at some points yeah. they all do we we talked about this in like the first or second episode of the podcast how like hoarders always hit this point where it was a real bummer because you'd just be like oh no this person has like serious mental issues yeah like you, you try and watch that show because you thought it'd be fun, but then it stops being fun. It's fun every now and then, and then every, like, one in five episodes, you're like, oh, this 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 poor person needs help. Like, yeah. Um, like, with, 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 uh, with, with uh, Queer Eye, they kind of touch a little bit on serious stuff, but for the most part, it's very fun. Like, there there's there is one episode where they help a preacher, uh, but one of the guys was, like, super religious growing up. Um, one of the Fab Five? Yeah. So they just have a very interesting talk about religion. That's interesting. Yeah, but like it's kind of done in like a very safe way where they don't like it, it, it's just something they acknowledge, but maybe they'll go further with it. That's like one thing like I think Queer Eye when you watch it as just like a fun makeover show is great. But there's a lot of like push from the marketing team to be like, oh, this is acceptance. And this is like a big deal for LGBT community to have this show. Yeah. And I think it's such bullshit like it's really not because well like i guess the impression i always got it it's a show for straight people yeah it is yeah, exactly it is. what it advertised to be it's yeah. like queer eye for the straight guy yeah. no. but i think a lot of the marketing and advertising and a lot of the sometimes feel-good moments are like we've taught you not to be homophobic congratulations yay they do a bit of that but then there's this one episode where they help out a gay guy and he's a closet homosexual to his family and he lives a very separate life with his friends. And he does not consider himself like feminine in any single way and refers to himself as the straightest gay guy in Atlanta. That's really sad. Yeah. And it is the saddest episode with the happiest ending. It's just like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure it is like, it's just reality TV. No, like it, it but like, this is one where like it kind of broke the reality TV mold. And got, like, super good. And I kind of wish they didn't film certain parts of it. I kind of hate the core concept of kind of getting vaguely homophobic people who are kind of gross and getting five gay people to be like, hey, stop being, like, kind of homophobic and gross at the same time and we'll do up your kitchen. Yeah. Like, I just, like, that's where There's I... There's a kinda... toothlessness there. Yeah. yeah. But, see, but see, the thing but about... But I think the... that's fine. Like, it's well, just no, reality. But TV. see, like, the thing about the season is the men in it aren't really homophobic. They're just, like, they just don't understand... That is homophobia. But, like, well, they're like, not... what do they not understand? Just taking care of themselves? Yeah. I mean, I get that. Like, if... But they do push the whole, like, they don't get, like, oh, gay guys as well aspect of it. It's not just that they happen to be gay. It's the like, fact that it's gay of, men helping straight men. Kind of. It, it, it's just different to the original series that way. Yeah, I know, I know. But, like, and I think that's fine. Like, I think it's a fun show to watch. But the marketing around it really pushed this whole, like, we're bridging a gap between people. And I thought that was really disingenuous for what is a real, just, like, kind of just a reality show. Yeah. I, I, I didn't see any marketing. I, I, I merely watched it on a whim because yeah. uh, another friend recommended it. So I, I just, I I recommend it. Um. Okay. So... I've been pretty excited about to talk about this next thing. So I want to do a little setup here, okay? Imagine you had something you loved your entire life, and then one day you found out that there was just a completely better version of it in every way, a superior version in every way. So like if you had like your favorite burrito, but then found out another burrito place does a better version of it. Yeah, the other like the other burrito places sources all its ingredients. It's way more legitimate. It's like nicer staff, comfier seats, like better flour, just everything. Everything down to the finest detail is better. I started watching New Japan Wrestling, New Japan Pro Wrestling. And I started with Wrestle Kingdom 11. This was a five-hour wrestling pay-per-view. 
I had no experience with New Japan. I had dipped in and out of matches in my time. I had just never sat down and watched it properly. And oh my God, I love New Japan so much. My girlfriend has had to put up with so much shit this week because I won't shut up about it. Okay, imagine wrestling, except if everyone's gimmick was just that they were a wrestler who tried very hard. That's New Japan, and it's fucking incredible. So it's just all good guys? No, no. <laughs> no, that's not what I said. <laughs> okay. Like, I, I'm exaggerating it there a little bit, but everyone's gimmick is just that they're a wrestler, and but their personality comes through with the matches because these performers are so fucking incredible at telling stories through wrestling matches that they just... You just get it. You're like, oh, I, I get what's happening here. No one says it, like people don't talk on the mic often. There's no backstage sections. No one drugs anyone and marries them. No one starts a secret cult except kind of the Bullet Club. It's just, it's just so beautiful. It's theater. It's theater, and it is like there's so much I want to say. Okay, there's a tag team called the Golden Lovers, who are two men. Kenny Omega and Kota Ibushi, who may or may not be in love, but they're pretty fucking in love. And it has been a storyline that's been developing for 10 years and only came to fruition recently. And it is genuinely one of the most touching and beautiful things I have ever seen. And they're both amazing wrestlers. So, okay. The biggest heels in New Japan are this faction called the Bullet Club. And the Bullet Club's whole gimmick is that they're American. It's just filled with American wrestlers who wrestle like they're in America. So they interfere, they do chair shots, they do all this bullshit that only American wrestlers do. And that's how they're the, like, people just fucking either love them or hate them in Japan because they're ruining Japanese wrestling. But that's their gimmick and it's incredible. Um... I'm gonna drop a I'm gonna drop a loot drop later, and it's this really cool YouTuber called Showbuckle, and Showbuckle, what he does is he takes J matches from New Japan and breaks down the story being told, and the one I want to talk about is there's this series between um, Okada and Tanahashi, and this is called the Battle for New Japan's Ace because at any point New Japan has like an ace who's like the face of the company, like the Rock or the Hulk Hogan. And it's just the story between these two guys. And the entire story, it's just wrestling matches. And it's like fucking fascinating. So the first thing that happens, I'll, I'll, I want to I get the ball rolling a little bit, is Okada comes out and he has this shitty wrestling match with this kind of nobody. And he's crap. He's not good. It's not a good match. It's not entertaining. His finish is weak. His clothes don't fit right. And so then Tanahashi, who is like, the guy in New Japan, like, is the main event that night, and he wins. And then Okada comes out, and Okada, Okada is also known as the Rainmaker, because when he walks out on stage, it rains money, because that's how fucking good at wrestling he is. So, Okada comes out, and he challenges Tanahashi at the next thing, and Tanahashi's like, Listen, kid, you have a long way to go before you can ever, like, even think of challenging me. But I'm in a good mood tonight, so I'll see you at the next event. So the next event, they come together. Okada the rookie, Tanahashi the hero. And Okada fucking destroys him because his shit match was only a ruse to lower Tanahashi's guard. So it's like if a jobber came in and beat the shit out of like Hulk Hogan. That's what this is like. They have like four more matches after that. And there's like plot twists in these matches. Like... He's going for his knee again, <gasps> but he knows from their last match that he was going to go for his knee, so he dodged, but now he's going for his arm. It's fucking brilliance. Is it like a live action animated, like, it's like live action anime, I guess. No. No? It's like theater. It's yeah. like theater. Okay. It's like really amazing theater. It, it, it's just what you described it sounded like, uh, the, the boxing anime with the... Okay, the way I describe it is like... We have all enjoyed media that has taken from New Japan. It's not the other way around. Yakuza 
Yakuza is just fucking New Japan with wrestlers. <laughs> okay. It's the same fucking thing. It is exactly the same. And um, I just... It has been a long time since I found something I love this much. But like, Bullet Club t-shirts are ordered. I, 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 I do the Too Sweet with Michelle all the time. The Too Sweet, everyone, is when you make a little wolf... Okay, Brian, yeah. put up your hands. Make a little wolf face. Yeah. Too Sweet. Neve. Too sweet. That's what we all do now. Is it wolves kissing? It is. That is cute. Yeah. <laughs> like a sniff kiss. Yeah. This is. The, it's something that the NWO used to do way back in the day. And the Bullet Club are a ripoff of NWO, but they're a fake NWO in Japan. And it's like, there's so much here. Kenny Omega is such a good boy. What a troubled life. He wanted to be the best. His boyfriend abandoned him, he joined the Bullet Club, he became the leader of the Bullet Club, but he missed his boyfriend so fucking badly that it tore him apart inside, even when he rose to the top of New Japan, even when he became the Shiaku. <laughs> Everyone will have seen the video I'm releasing on wrestling by the time this comes out. So. Oh, really? Yep. Nice. I think I'm about to destroy my career, but I just, I feel a little love wrestling right now and I can't hold it back anymore. I, I, I think you're about to get a whole bunch of new fans. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. The passion's real. Well, yeah. right now, this is the Wednesday before the video uploads. Right now, the video is a fucking garbage fire. But it always is at this point, so it doesn't matter. But uh, Yeah, but you seem pumped. I just... Kota Ibushi and Kenny Omega love each other so fucking much and just, they can't be together because they both want to be the best. What are they meant to do? I... Read that Twitter thread you sent Rebecca about the two of them. And I was just like, this is just your fan fiction. This is cute. It's not fan fiction, though. No, it is. They're that's, tagged. They kissed. Story they kissed. Like, I believe there was a Hanzo McCree fan fiction very similar to that one. Okay, that Hanzo McCree. That Hanzo <laughs> Ma Why don't I don't fucking care what they're called. McKenzie. That <laughs> shitty Overwatch Cowboy Samurai fan fiction can go fuck itself because it's not real, unlike wrestling. So... The wrestling champions in the WWE, are they affiliated with this? Because they're both Japanese, aren't they? Shinsuke Nakamura is former New Japan. And Asuka is not. And Asuka's not the champion. She was the NXT champion. Now she's on the main roster. Okay. And then next week at WrestleMania, she's fighting Charlotte Flair for the championship. And that is my most anticipated match. John, I want to watch Asuka fight. And I don't know where anyone would start with wrestling because it's impenetrable, quite like X-Men. Where does one start? X-Men and wrestling have the same problem because they're both just soap operas that have been going since the beginning of time. Yeah, it's kind of like you can start anywhere, but where? Um, Honestly, like... Kinda anywhere. <laughs> like, <laughs> give me a name. <laughs> uh, uh, like, uh, watch WrestleMania. Okay. Uh, I would also say watch Wrestle Kingdom. Uh, Tiger Mask fights at Wrestle Wrestle Kingdom. I like do. the actual Tiger Mask. I do the real Tiger life Mask. person Tiger Mask fights. The real Tiger. He's out of the cage. And he also fights Dark Tiger. <laughs> <laughs> and Whoa. it's an anime. It's an anime inspired match. I watched this shit with Michelle. And Michelle was like, this is fucking good. And I was like, yeah, we watched fucking Kenny Omega versus Okada. That match was an hour long or close to it. Fucking riveted the entire time. I'm going to move on now because I won't stop. I love New Japan so much. It's still real to me, damn it. So Brian, uh, how, how, is, um, how is Atlanta season two? Yeah, uh, Atlanta is back for a second season. This is uh, the drama comedy made by Childish Gambino, a.k.a. Donald, Donald Glover. Um, do you guys watch the show at all? Never checked no. it out. No? Um, kind of like, since it came back, he's been doing a lot of interviews, Donald Glover. And a lot of the way people kind of introduce the show is they're like, it's like Twin Peaks for rappers. It's okay. That sounds good. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. And you know what? They're right. Okay. So like the way it works is that it it it, it it's got a small cast of characters, but Don Glover is trying to make his cousin a famous rapper, and his cousin is like in his mid to late thirties, and he's called Paperboy, and he's famous in Atlanta, but that's about it, and uh. 
his cousin, Ern, played by Donald, is a Princeton dropout who's pretty savvy but has the worst luck ever. And they're just trying to make it. And you you uh, would think it's the other way around because he's Childish Gambino as a rapper. But like he doesn't rap at all in this show. He just acts. Um, but it's just like their weird world and it, how it gets really super surreal sometimes. And it's kind of a comedy show, but some episodes are not funny. When you say surreal, what are we talking? Uh, in the most recent episode, they go to... This is in season two. In the most recent episode, they go to a German, like, traditional fair where everyone is dressed in, like, lederhosen and dindels. And there's, like, monsters in it. Huh. In one episode, a pe- bunch of people get knocked over by an invisible car. I feel like this could either be really cool or really terrible. No, it's really cool, I promise. Okay, because con- conceptually, I was just like, that doesn't sound... You, that you, sounds weird. You said some, some episodes aren't funny. Yeah. Are those failures or are they fine? It, it, it's just this weird thing where, like, it'll suddenly switch tone and you just have to go with it. Like, because uh, sometimes I'll watch it and I'm like, I don't know if I like this show. But then I'm like, no, but they, they like, a bunch of interesting stuff happened in front of my eyes. So I, I like it. Yeah, that's sometimes yeah, the yeah. best part. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I just think they just make up a bunch of stuff. And they just film it. And some episodes, like, there's there's, there's, there's one episode, because, like, uh, the uh, character, Ern, um, he has, like, an on-and-off girlfriend, and they have a daughter together. But in season one, she's um, a school teacher. But she goes out with a friend, and they go out for dinner, and they talk about their lives and how she's not really happy with her life. But then they smoke a joint together. But then the next day when she goes into work, they're doing their monthly drug test. Oh, no. And she's freaking out. So she has to get, like, baby urine, put it in a condom and sellotape it to the side of her leg so that she could pour that into a drug test cup. Baby urine? What if that what if that baby is, like... Hi. Yeah. yeah. But then it turns out they did that, that they don't even test those things. But she tries to be the better person and admits it, but gets fired. Yeah, no, don't do that. <laughs> but then, like, the episode ends in the most surreal way where, like, she still has to finish off the day of school, but she has to supervise detention. And there's a little black kid in detention, and he's put in detention because he did whiteface. And he's just staring at her, and he's just smiling at her, laughing at her. And I think, like, it's meant to mean something and then before you try and click, but it ends. It's really... I, I like that. Yeah, it's kind it's of really weird. <laughs> Sounds cool. It's really fucking cool. I like. I I really like it when shows kind of start to get at something, but they just don't. It's like 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 that scene in uh, Six Feet Under, yeah. where it's like <laughs> the Nate I think yeah. has the dream where it's his dad, life and death, like four people playing poker, and then life and death start fucking each other, and then his dad just goes, "Well, son." There it is, and then he wakes up, and you're like, "Wait, what? What?" Yeah, it's really like Six Feet Under. Um, there's a tiny bit of time travel in this. Okay. Oh my god! And sometimes, okay, cool. and sometimes they'll talk about urban legends like Florida Man, but then they'll bring it up later on. Like, and people are like, "Yeah, man, Florida Man." So it doesn't feel aimless. They're like they're dropping lore. It, no, no, it is aimless, but there's lore. I promise. <laughs> but like, I I don't know what's gonna happen in each episode because like. It, it'll end and there might be a cliffhanger and you're like, oh, well, maybe they'll pick it up in the next episode. You might not see the character for the rest of the season. Do you guys think Donald Glover is a good actor? I haven't seen him in enough. Uh, I, really I guess liked, we'll see in Han. Yeah, I really, I really liked him in the Derek comedy shorts like 10 years ago. He's, I feel like he's a charming boy, great rapper, great stand-up. He's uh, not a great actor. Wait, he's in Community. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. think he's really yes. likable yes, in that. He, very charming. Yeah, yeah. Not a great actor. But sometimes all you need is charm. If you only That's play not charming. That's the fucking characters. conversation we're having, Neve. <laughs> He's shredded as well. Like. He's so shredded. All yeah. you need yeah. is charm and abs. I really, I really, really love his stand up. Uh, there, there, there is a really, really famous one that was on Netflix for a couple of years. That was a good stand up. Yeah, and he's talking about Bed Bath and Beyond, or as he refers to it, Auschwitz for children, because <laughs> it's just like your parents, like, like it's a DIY shop, and you just have to spend all day there, and it fucking sucks. 
I like all um, his music videos. He acts really well in those. He does. Yeah, he does. Mm-hmm. Okay. He so, sells it in a few minutes. Okay. So he, he, he's got charisma. I'll give him that. Mm-hmm. Those music videos, um, the guy who directs those music videos directs uh, Atlanta. Oh, okay. So, so it, it looks like those. That's cool. They look great. Yeah. I, I think... I, just, I really love that Freaks and Geeks music video. Like, I love that song because obviously everyone does. But, like, what a fucking just straight up raw ass video and it's cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, real quick, I just want to do a little, little call out to someone who's come up on the podcast before a few times. I checked out, like, the first... Now, granted, it was only the first 15 minutes... But I checked it, checked out like the first fifteen minutes of the Ricky Gervais stand up special. <laughs> Me too. I think that guy's a fucking piece of shit. Yeah. It's been a long time since I wanted to beat the shit out of a celebrity, but I I want to hurt him. He like literally opens with an AIDS joke. Okay. And then he goes, "It's been seven years since I done I've done this," and you're like, "Yeah, it yeah, has. It, has. it okay. really okay. fucking has, buddy." Then he does this joke about um. What do you get the blind, deaf kid for Christmas? Cancer. Fucking hell. And I was like, oh, okay, okay, like, you know, lame joke or whatever. Mm-hmm. I was like, I'm fucking sure I've heard that joke before. I am sure. We all have, because we were all 15. So I googled it. The first result that came up was from 2008. So not only, like, are his jokes kind of lame... He's stealing jokes. I feel like he's stealing them from a kid's like playground. Like yeah. it's like such crap. Um, do you I know? Wouldn't... Do you know how much he got paid for that Netflix special? Ugh. Forty million dollars. Okay, so like I wouldn't, I wouldn't be like calling him out because like who gives a shit about mediocrity? Like he's just lame. But then he does this whole like kind of, I felt like really fucking anti-trans thing. And it was really infuriating just to, like, sit there and watch because, like, it's this tired-ass material and he's going after, like, Caitlyn Jenner and all that kind of stuff, you know? And it was just a consistent bunch of lame jokes about how this girl used to have a dick. And it's like, it wasn't funny. He wasn't saying any. Like, I know, obviously, comedy is very subjective. He wasn't saying anything. But you know he's not even writing these as jokes. He knows that this is like a topic he can try and push buttons with. And he's doing it to be cruel. Like he's a cruel person saying cruel things because it no- he knows he'll get his like Twitter likes. I honestly think that's how See, he I, 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 I kind of have a different read. I think he's so fucking stupid he didn't know that was going to happen. And then when it did, he was like, oh shit, what can I do now? And then he takes up this like humanist approach oh okay you now, think he I, like i like i i hmm. do not i don't have faith in his intelligence enough that he could plan that far yeah ahead. he's probably very det- detached from reality yeah. um um i was talking to a trans friend of mine about this and they said something really cool i think they're quoting someone satire is meant to ridicule power if you're laughing at people who are hurting it's not satire it's bullying and that's what i really felt from this and i was kind of disgusted by it honestly yeah um Man, if I had fucking half a mind, I would, I would sure like to <laughs> tear this guy a new one in some, in some form, in some format. But we'll see. But um, I used to like Ricky Gervais. I, I I like extras. I like The Office. I thought that stuff was cool. Incredibly disappointed. Not like, first of all, in his skill as a comedian. His jokes were so tired. I remember seeing interviews with him from six or seven years ago where he said he wasn't going to do jokes about animals talking anymore because it was too easy. He fucking opens with that. Yeah. So as a comedian, I'm so disappointed in him because I think being like comedian, be, people who are comedians, they're so incredible. It's such an amazing skill. It takes such wit and like observation and like people can really say stuff as well. Like, um, yeah, like, like it's really creativity at its purest form because you're mm-hmm. coming up with something out of nothing yeah and to be able to be able to just turn it on in front of uh, like you know I, I have my issues with Dave Chappelle as well and he's guilty of a lot of the same stuff Ricky Gervais is he has shit to say and I don't think mm-hmm. anyone could argue that he doesn't and um, that's what really got me about this it just felt so empty and so tired and for it to be gross on top of that for it to him to be kind of going after people who like they're defenseless like it's punching down 
that was really pathetic, especially in this day and age when there's so much to talk about. Anyway, just want to shit on that guy for a little bit. I feel I've done that adequately now. Yeah, yeah fuck him. So fuck that dude. Yeah, totally. So we're going to move on now. Um, the final thing we got to talk about in our quest log <laughs> is Ready Player One. Uh, how many of you guys have seen Ready Player One? Uh, None. Yeah, I don't think we've seen it yet. We haven't seen it, but we're actually going to talk about it. And how might we do that, I hear you ask, dear listener? Well, through the magic of editing. Over to you, John. Thank you, John, for that beautiful handoff. So, uh, I'm going to paint a picture for you guys. It is like half 10, 10 10.30 for you Americans. We're wandering the rain-soaked streets of Dublin, and we have all just come out of Ready Player One, the greatest story ever told. John, that's a lie. (laughs) <laughs> Such a hardcore lie. I okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna open the volley here. That is my least favorite movie I've ever seen. I think it's the worst film I've ever seen. Not the worst for me, but in my top five. Like not being facetious, that that film, Neve, you put it best. I felt negative emotions, like mm-hmm. not bad emotions, like the minus inversion of emotion is what I felt. If I've seven feelings to me. I now only have five because it removes some. Yeah. Um, I think I was the only one who was like optimistic about this film or looking forward to it. Ten minutes in, I wanted to get off that ride. It was like, like for me even, I thought it was a shitty piece of shit. Like the level of like reference, it's so surface level and so just completely like even less than I thought it would be. Like it's just like, oh, there's a character you recognize, or oh, there's a bit you recognize. But that stuff's all bad. That stuff's just like, it's nothing. And like, it's a, it's a film without a story. There is no story. There's a plot. Mm-hmm. It's not a story. There's no character development. There's no world building. For something that hinges so much on this kind of dark, shadowy company trying to take over something and have like outward con- out, like consequences in the real world and in the Oasis, we don't know anything about that company. That is the most inept super company I have ever seen. Yeah. Like, it's fucking, they are fucking Scooby-Doo villains, those guys. My <laughs> best moment in it is in the bad guys reveal their motivation was to put advertising in the UI of the Oasis system. And that that's super bad, that sucks. Next shot, it's them in a literal virtual shop where you see the logos for Overwatch and Halo. It's like, oh no, not advertising in the Oasis. <laughs> so... All that stuff was bad. It was a plastic, sad, just nothing movie. But there was a bit about halfway in, and we decided we don't want to spoil this bit because people should just come to it on their own. But we'll just say, like, part of it takes place entirely in a very beloved piece of media. And this is the part where the film started actively hurting me. Like... I, can, I, I, I just I, I don't even remember what I said I just got very panicked when it seemed like we were going to what we were going to and it happened and we spent 10-15 minutes there yeah mm-hmm. 15 minutes inside uh, a full reference yeah this this is something that isn't any, in, 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 in the promotional material or anything like this completely caught us off guard so that's why we don't want to spoil it because we think that if you're curious you'll know the bit we're talking about Jesus fucking Christ what the f- you like, I don't, I don't even get annoyed about, like, this kind of stuff. Oh, we got to... All right. I don't even get annoyed about this kind of stuff because, like, I always just feel like the original piece of media is always the original piece of media and you can't change that. This was awful. Like, it was the most just surface-level dismantling of such an important thing. And, like, it was just... From the way they worked it, they don't understand anything about the thing that they were basing it in. Do you notice that there's no Steven Spielberg characters in the whole thing? And he said he didn't want to put his characters in it. I think he has more respect for his shit than he has for other people's shit. Yeah, there's there, 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 there stuff he produced, like Back to the Future, and he has a big connection with what Warner Brothers and Iron Giant and stuff like that, because he's very close to Brad Bird. But there's no Jaws, um, e. there's no E.T., there's no Indiana Jones, but maybe he doesn't own that stuff. It's just... Did he direct that? Yeah, he directed all the Indiana Jones films. No, did he direct Ready Player One? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Spielberg. He's fucking shit now. It's like some people are saying, well, look, guys, it's still a Spielberg film. It's still, like, it's still good because of that. 
No. No. No, it's not. And I have seen people say that this film, it's actually pretty alright, it's fun. They are wrong and they don't understand art. They don't. I'm sorry, they don't. It's true. Mm -hmm. This film makes me like art less. So, how, how did we describe it? That it's like being trapped in... A, a for me, it was being trapped in a queue for a toilet or food at a con, and there's four people in front of you talking the most inane bullshit conversation, and you need to pee, and you need to get food, so you can't leave, and you're there for two and a half hours, I guess, and it's just suffering. Uh, the way I described it was that it's like being trapped in an elevator with 10 14 year olds who have all just discovered or slash atheism and they all just keep <laughs> screaming do you get the reference how about you brian for me it was the monster within that i don't want to let out and it reared its ugly head and i went no that was for one night once and i'll never see that boy again ever it was like just a genuinely awful film mm -hmm. like just soulless and plastic on every level and I'm sad now like I'm actually sad like the film made me sad can yeah. you say one nice thing about it I liked about five seconds when one robot thing was fighting another robot thing yeah like there were there, there, like for, for, for a moment there was a bit of hope mm -hmm. then there wasn't the one bit I liked was there's a car race at the start that doesn't have any music it just has sound design of different car engines and I thought that was good I thought I would like that, but I thought it was a really boring character. I thought it was just completely soulless. The stakes are so low because you know they're not going to die. Like, yeah. They're just like, all right, cool. Uh, the one good thing I could say is it does seem to be a feat in 3D animation. It was very fluid, and the cuts between animated segments and live action segments were just perfect. Like, there was no jarring. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, like it felt very seamless. Mm hmm. Compared to something like James Cameron's it, Avatar I, I film, the three D character designs were hideous. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it, it it is an yeah. ugly looking film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just, it is not a beautiful film. I hate this movie. It, it has shitty cinematography. It's just awful. Awful. Out of ten. Zero. Yeah. Zero. Yeah. Yeah. Zero. Yeah. Just a zero to ten film. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a machine made by algorithms. A film. Yeah, it's just it's nothing. You know, guys, I think we should go back to us in the past. Okay. Yeah. You know, and you know what. Fucking Chun Li and Tracer didn't even kiss, and they were gonna look like idiots. Total idiots. All right, back to you in the future, you ungrateful assholes. Don't go and see it. And we're back, man. I can't believe we actually all loved Ready Player One. <laughs> I know I did. I can't just. I I couldn't like. I was expecting it to be bad, and just it was so good, and there were so many kind of layers with the characters, and just they actually did the reference stuff really well. What do you think, Neve? I just really loved when Chun Li and Tracer kissed. I, I know, I know. <laughs> it passed the Bakdel test. It was LGBT friendly. Mm -hmm. It was literally the most amazing film I've ever seen. Mm. I thought it was really racist. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. Oh, anyway, um, let's talk about Bloodborne because I think we've all been playing it. Speaking of Bloodborne, I went to a con in Cork over the weekend called Kaizoku Con. Kaizoku Con. They pronounce it Kaizoku Khan, I think. It's Kaizoku. It, it means pirate. Okay, Kaizoku. Yeah, you would know. Yeah. Kaizoku Khan. Um, really, really cool little con. Um, really friendly staff. Met a bunch of fans. Had two panels. Fucking. The panel on the Saturday was really great. And there were some really amazing, great questions. And I got to talk about Grappler Backy a bunch on stage in front of a room of people, <laughs> which is just what I've always dreamed. Um. I think every panel I do from now on, I'm going to have a grappler backy section because that's a fun show to tell people about. But um, the reason I bring it up is that, okay, so the con is like in this like square and it's like, it's like kind of, you know, it's not huge. It's a little kind of, it, but it's, it's, it's on like the ground. It's a college, college. Yeah, 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 yeah. College campus. And so there's the con, the building, like the student building. Then right beside the building, there's a chapel. And at this chapel was a wedding not 20 feet from the con. No! Yes! Yes! Oh, did they embrace it? They need to embrace that shit and get photos with cosplayers. They did not. Oh, no! Oh. <laughs> Uh, I wanna, I'm gonna, I, I will, I will find a way to communicate this to the fans, probably through the Instagram. 
here. My aunt and uncle got married in that chapel. Yep. It's a really, really nice chapel, and that's a very unfortunate double booking. That's amazing, though. Oh, no. Oh, that's so good, right outside the church with the weddings there. That's how far it was, and <laughs> I just couldn't believe this. I was like, holy shit, like... Because obviously they wanted to use the grounds for photos. They can't now because they're full of weebs. <laughs> um, and so later on, I, w- I was out for drinks at like the charity auction. And I was chatting to some of the organizers at KaizuCon. And I was like, what the fuck happened? And they're like, "That no, that's every year. And I was like, what? That chapel is the special UCC chapel. You can only get married there if you're former UCC alumni. Mm-hmm. What? Which means that it's booked year round. <laughs> so every year, one, <laughs> one kai. What's it called, Ryan? Kaizuku. Kaizuku. Kaizuku Khan. <laughs> one sure. Kaizuku Khan falls on one wedding every year. There has been five Kaizuku Khans. They have ruined five weddings. <laughs> I kind of feel like wedding booking should go with this and, ha- and charge a premium for this. Because if it's alumni, they know the weebs come. That's the thing. Last year, the, the bride and groom were super pumped about it. Like, I don't think they were weebs. I think they were just fascinated. And they took pictures of all the cosplayers, which is what you got to do. It's what you got to do. Yeah. I was in a dog park flow. and there was like wedding photos there. And there was like dogs just running around and pooping everywhere. And like, they could have been really mad and ruined everything. But they were like... Let's get a photo with those dogs. I'd be pretty fucking pumped if there was a bunch of dogs in my yeah, wedding. Yeah, there was a great photo of a dog pooping in front of the couple. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> they had a great time. But if you like went the other way and you were like, I'm so pissed off. They ruined my magical day. Because the park is beautiful. There's great arches and flowers and stuff. There's dogs pooping everywhere. Like, you're just going to have a shit wedding. But if you embrace it, you had the cool dog wedding. Like, mate, like I feel like that's kind of what you got to do. Like, well, like with weddings and stuff. And day, like big special days like that. Once it starts, you just kind of have to accept that it is what mm-hmm. it is and just embrace it. Birthdays, weddings, funerals, maybe less funerals. But yeah. Oh, no, the funeral is the most planned event of your life. Yeah. What are you going to do at my funeral, Neve? Not at your funeral, my funeral. You see, you guys have to sit there for as long as I wish. There, I can make you watch anything. <laughs> I, I will bet you any amount of money, Neve, that you will outlive me. Uh, I'm definitely I living really the longest. I really want to make people live through, like, through my funeral. I'm definitely living the longest, so I'll, 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 I'll be at your funeral. Mm. <sighs> okay, thank you. I might, I might like prop you up out of the coffin. We'll do a high five. We'll do some photos together. I just want to like do like a bad karaoke version of a full album and make people sit through it for my funeral. And they <laughs> can't leave. Like they just can't. No, it's disrespectful. It's like don't disrespect me. You can't leave. Yeah, that can be karaoke at my funeral if you want. It's gonna be in like sixteen months. So sweet, yeah. We should go to like a water park for your funeral, and we can like all toboggan down and the slide together. I famously loved. Water park. <laughs> yeah, she just loves it. It's pee, but everywhere. Bloodborne. <laughs> who played Bloodborne? Who likes it? Who likes? Neve, who likes Neve. the best game ever made? How you getting along with Bloodborne? I love Bloodborne. It's so good. Thanks so much. Such Thank a you. good game. Thanks. We're we're we're. we're you didn't uh, make it, Brian. <laughs> we're uh, still friends. I know, but you know, you know how when you're like a piece yeah, of shit yeah, yeah. and you let the media, you like validate your personality. Yes. So when someone likes your media, you're like, Yes, I do. <laughs> you like me. Yeah, I'm doing that. It's so good and I like I'm having such a great time just like I didn't take Brian's guide so I'm still blind and I think I want to play it that way even though it's taking me so long. Probably is but that's okay. Like a snail like oh man I am such a high level and I have gotten not very far. (laughs) That's okay though that'll like that'll just make it easier later. What level do you think you should be when fighting the Vicar Amelia? Vicar Amelia. I think I was level 30. Okay. I think I was mid twenties, but I'm not, I can't really remember. Okay, like forty. That's okay. And you can't beat her. It's not. This is the thing. Is like I am running through the base enemies of everywhere. I've cleared them out and I farm them over and over again. When it gets to a boss, I am golden until the last sliver of health, and then I get this like thing where I'm like, oh, I just need to hit them like two more times, and I choke and I is die. Is it like performance anxiety? Yeah, like I just completely choke. You should read the art of playing tennis. Really? Tell me about more? Um, it's like, it's this game that the fighting game, or it's this book that the fighting game community got really into, 
and it's about like performance under pressure and like how to handle it and stuff. It's really good. That's that's yeah. what you should read if you want to be Bloodborne. No, no, I actually might because I've noticed it. Like, it is a thing even in, like, competitive shooters and stuff. It's like, I could be doing so well, and once my brain starts to acknowledge that I'm doing well, then I'm, like, psh, I'm, like, just down there, and I can't roll out, I can't get out, I can't recover, that's, and I'm That's done. interesting, because I'm, like, the complete opposite. I am total garbage right up until my last sliver of health, and then my brain wakes up and goes, okay. You get scrappy. Um, that happens to me in games that are very simple to control, like Mario Kart. Because uh, you know that game's only like like three buttons and steering, but like sometimes I'm like, what's ter- what 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 <laughs> what what's the power steering button again? And I'll fuck up and I'll choke. You'll break yourself out of your own flow and fuck up everything yeah, because you just start overthinking it. Mm-hmm. And like that happens to me. At, like it was the same with Father Gascoigne. I beat Father Gascoigne, and he was really hard. But like I fought him like ten times, and he had like the tiniest bit of health, and I could just never get past that. Once he was on me, I just like I was dead. The first time I fought him, that happened. The very first time I got him down to his last sliver of health, he killed me. Twenty tries later, I killed him. But I like yeah. Yeah, 20 times with, like, Father Gascon. Definitely. And I was just like, I bet I've learned loads. And I did. And I totally ran through the next area, which was, like, Old Yarnum. Yeah. I kind of went there instead of going to the cathedral first. That's so, fine. So I ended up with the, like, the the blood-starved beast as my next he's boss. He's he To me, he's the hardest boss in the game. Okay, because him, again, down to that one sliver, and then I just mess up. Then, like, um, I went back and fought... The, like the vicar yeah and vicar, about... vicar Amelia might be my favourite boss design she's cool maybe yeah. beside Margot's wet nurse she's yeah. just like a saluki dressed like a mummy Yeah, I really like that she looks like a shadow of the colossus monster because she looks like a f- f- uh, Ico character from, from that she, world I think she looks like someone's dog just covered in toilet roll it's really yeah. good yeah no I just really <laughs> like how her hair is done because they're just these very long strands and you know how hair technology is very hard to do in video games. So they like didn't, even, they didn't even try, not, so she looks real shaggy. Not a launch mm-hmm. game, but that was early in PS4 architecture. Yeah, it, it, it came out in the first year of the system. Like, I was kind of surprised how sort of, when I went back to it, how janky it looked. Yeah. And, like, the art direction is incredible, but it is a, it is pretty janky. Yeah. No, it, it looks like the greatest PS2 game ever. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, that is what it looks like. <laughs> it just looks like like that really, really nice PS2 game. Did you guys go for the shotgun or the pistol? Shotgun always. The blunderbuss. Because I'm using the pistol. I'm using the pistol too. Holy shit, that thing is much better than the shotgun. Same, it's, yeah. it, it's just got a quicker draw. Quicker draw, longer just range. Just distance, yeah. The yeah. range is what I really miss from it. Yeah, because um, I, I played through my did my first run through with the shotgun, and I never really got good at parrying. I, I, I've got the parrying with the shotgun time down, but I have a DLC weapon for long range attacks, which is the bow, and it kind of works. But like that game isn't really designed for range. Yeah, but with the pistol, it's like you know you can get good and far away with an enemy and then parry them and just run in and grab them like where there's no danger at all, and it's really handy. But um, I'm having a great time with it. That is hot take here. Bloodborne's a pretty good video game. <gasps> mm-hmm. Shocking. Yeah. yeah. We, get, we get spicy here on the boss cast. Do you think it'll win best old game? Yeah. Ooh, could 20. do. Because yeah. it won number two. I'm back in... so happy that I don't know anything about it. At all. Yeah, I just managed to not I'm, take I'm, it in. I'm real excited for you to... Like, there's no, like, plot twists. But yeah. just the way that game unfolds is fucking great. When I first saw the big skeleton dude, like the really tall guy in a top hat with an axe and then another one has a ball and a they're chain. They're so cool. They're so tall and big. I was like, oh no. <laughs> like, yeah. no. And now I can just take them down. Yeah. But like when a boss makes you stop, like that's so good. Or not just a boss, just a random enemy. I, I, I really like when you get a bit too cocky and you're like, I'm pretty good at this game. Mm-hmm. And then you'll just fuck up so bad. And you're like, well, you know what? That was on me. You'll run into like a crowd of the low tier enemies. They'll all hit you at once and you fucked up. Yeah, absolutely. I like it when you kill them and they're like, I've cobbled me britches. <laughs> this town's finished. Oh, me bollocks. Oh, I like the, I like the one that's like, you're cursed. You know, because I'm like, am I? <laughs> Every Away! Time. Away were you! I love that one. 
That's the guy oh, with the, the torch. The sound design is so good in that game. Yeah. The fucking cleric beast and its noises. <laughs> oh, it, it's just the screaming game. And like you, you said it last episode, Neil, but you know the bit where you just go up to the, the door and you knock and all you hear is... <laughs> I really love those doors. So every door with a red light I can I can knock on. Pretty much, yeah. Like it's got a little lantern. It means mm-hmm. there's some NPC that they didn't bother modeling that you can interact with. Mm. Um, I really like the guys that look like a scaled down version of the El Gigante from Resident Evil 4. And they have like a brick. Oh, uh, yeah. And they go like, oh. Um, have you gotten to the safe space, Neve? Yeah, you, you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's like it's like this, like, there's this little gnome lad. He's really easy to miss. Is this the one in the red? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And he's just like, you send it anyone my way who like needs help and stuff. Yeah. Have yeah. you sent it? No, I haven't sent anyone yet, but he seems dodge. No, he's not. No, he's cool. He's not going to eat no, someone's flesh. No, but the people you can send there can be pretty dodge. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, it's really worth looking up some lore videos because they actually do some really like cool and subtle storytelling in that chapel. But maybe a, maybe a post game thing to check out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, everyone's been telling me to look up lore like post game because yeah. it'll just spoil yeah, me. Yeah, no, do because like, yeah, like the don't. world and story of Bloodborne, is fucking awesome. Like mm-hmm. it's better than the Dark Souls games, I think. It's really cool. I really like piecing it all together, and it's always visually interesting. A very good video game. Very good. Yeah, we're gonna um, gonna go against the grain with that opinion. I know uh, Bloodborne never never reviewed very well, never built up much of a fan base, much like the Soul series. And uh, I think people will be relieved to hear someone finally talk about it on the internet. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Totally. Um, Brian. Yeah. Tell us about Kirby All Star Allies. Okay, uh, this is the new Kirby game for the Switch, and it's pretty good, but I didn't love it. Didn't love it? No. No. Okay, Brian, what's what, what's the difference between a good Kirby game and a great Kirby game? Okay, I guess, like, a list of stuff that kind of put me off. Okay. This game is four hours long. What? Is it full That's price? That's so bad. Uh, yeah, it's a full price game, and it's four hours long. Who? This is one of the easiest video games I've ever played in my life. And, like, I'm talking easy for Kirby. Mm-hmm. And, like... Kirby was, like, the one Game Boy game I could beat when I was little. Yeah, well, like, the first Kirby game is four levels long. You beat it in half an hour. And... um, But, like, this game is so easy in that, like, it's got collectibles and unlockable stuff. And even that's easy. Like, it, it's signposted everywhere. So you just feel like you're just running through the game? Yep. Yeah. That sucks. Um, the game is extremely well polished. Looks absolutely fantastic. Like, looks better than Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze in terms of being like you know a fully strong flourished, strong art direction. Yeah, strong art direction, two D, three D rendered uh, platformer. Um, and the ally system works pretty well. Um, what is the ally system? It, 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 it's just you swallow, well, like, I, I guess it's based from Kirby's Fun Pack, which is my favorite Kirby game. But it's just that you will throw your heart at enemies and then they'll join your side. And up to four people can play, which is something that they had in Return to Dreamland, Because this is like the Kirby version of the new Super Mario Brothers games on the Wii and the Wii U. Um, but like, I don't know, this, this Kirby game just doesn't do anything new. Right, right. There's some new abilities and they're okay, but... This doesn't feel like it was touched by Sakurai at all. There's no yeah. kind of like concepts. Like a lot of the music in this game is just old music that they'll just that's done by a new orchestra. Like like, it, like it's really 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 good fan service. Right. And the game feels like the nicest warmest hug, but it's not a satisfying hug. Hmm. What's a what's a not a satisfying hug? Like I don't a know. Slap? Like when someone's like kind of like they rub your back and like they kind of lean in, you can kind of. Or do you know what? They hug you, but you weren't finished with the hug. And you're like, but... And they end it with one of these. Yeah, honestly, the, it just... Don't pat. Yeah. It, rub, uh, rub or do nothing. Don't pat. I don't know. Like, I'd, I'd like a hug and then, like, a nice, like, encouraging bit of advice. But it doesn't do that. Yeah. I'm like for, like, for, like, most of the game, it'll set it up where, like, there's no dialogue whatsoever in this game. It's all told through them, like, miming and pantomiming, I guess. Or, you know, just doing a lot of corporal acting. 
of reacting to the narrative. But then towards the end of the game, you fight these bosses and they just have these big things of text dialogue. It comes out of nowhere and it just just doesn't fit. But then they kind of make fun of it later on because you fight one boss and he gives you so much text dialogue that they start skipping through it. I thought that was kind of clever, but I don't know. It just didn't fit the game. It's kind of like they introduced something just to make a joke of it like a few minutes later. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, I, I would not buy this game unless you're like a hardcore Kirby fan. That's disappointing. But yeah. you are a hardcore per Kirby fan. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, but like, this is not like a top tier Kirby game at all for me. And this is one of, I think this is like the third shortest Kirby game made. Are you going to trade it in? Or um, do you keep your Kirby games? I don't, like, I, I actually do keep my Kirby games. Do you own all the Kirby games? No. There's some games I don't want to own. Oh yeah? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not really interested in the GameCube racing one. Do you yeah. want to own this one? Yeah, I actually do. Okay. I, I just want to wait, not wait, because there's DLC extra characters, and I just want to watch them, because Marx is in it, and I really like him. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, 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 like, I, I wasn't disappointed by this game, because I played it, like, pretty much in one sitting after a party where I, where, where I had a really, really, really bad hangover. Even though I didn't get drunk, I still woke up with a hangover. Yeah. So to just sit down on a couch... And play like a really really nice game and like I, it actually really helped hmm. i think like this is like the perfect ha- ha- game for a hangover that, yeah but what demographic is that i'm like <laughs> i'm an adult and i'm hungover and i also like kirby <laughs> okay yeah i'd say i'd say there's some people out there okay it's just like a chalkboard a nintendo somewhere with like brian's face on yeah. It. yeah this is it this is where the money this is, is the guy <laughs> but you know what you know how like a month ago I had like a really 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 bad flu and I tried to play some games while I was off work Yeah, but I was so fucking wrecked all I did was sleep or like I couldn't even like concentrate enough I think like Kirby is perfect for that I think if you're as weak as a kid <laughs> it's just unreal I'm like they have it, Kirby, a game for weaklings I'm, yeah no like like this is like the best first game for a kid okay like, 100%. Straight out the womb. Yeah, straight out the womb. Give him Kirby. <laughs> <laughs> Slap that fucking switch in it his tiny hands. It basically plays itself, yeah, he, kid. Honestly, he'll beat it in four hours. It's like a disappointing hug. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's birth. <laughs> that's life. That is... That is... Okay. A resounding... Meh. No, like... Uh, I'm like... Yeah! <laughs> no! <laughs> okay. Good stuff. So um, I played two games aside from my usual. Although I, like I'm, I'm well done with Monster Hunter at this point, aside from just co-op stuff, and I'm done with Dragon Ball Fighter Z, <gasps> but only because I have to be like, okay, it's time to go play other games because this is becoming a little all-consuming. I started playing the story mode. Android Twenty One is really cool. I like her dress. I like her a lot. And I like her voice actor a lot. And she just she just goes around eating things and beating the shit out of things. And I like both those things. So I think we'd get on like super well. <laughs> um, she's really cool. But I also played two 2D survival horror games. The first was Claire and the second was Detention. I've heard of Detention. Haven't heard of Claire. So Claire is a game I've had my eye on for a while. It came out this month on PSN. So if you're hearing this, no, it's probably gone. Although it might still be there. So if you're hearing this like the night it goes up, Claire is free on PSN along with Bloodborne. Um, Quickly. And it is basically, okay, here's what Claire feels like to me. Claire feels like a 2D Silent Hill 3 fan game. The girl looks nearly exactly like Heather from Silent Hill 3. You wake up in a hospital, don't know what's going on. It's all getting attacked by odd monsters. It's all very... It's very Silent Hilly. And I was digging the aesthetic. I was liking the sound design. But then the kind of actual game kicked in. And, like, you kind of get attacked by these shadow monsters. You have to, like, run by them. That's kind of it so far i've only played like the first hour and a half or so and it's not really scary like mm. is it pixel yeah very and it looks cool mm. um th- they maybe overdo it a little bit with the lighting effects like but it's it's got a look and it's got a look that evokes that real 
kind of ashen amber Silent Hill 3 look, which is cool, you know. But it just feels too much like a fan game. It feels too much like someone just loved Silent Hill 3 and made their own game out of it. Um, I could be wrong, I'm only a little bit in. If there's people who's played it and can attest that this is a really good game, then by all means hit me up, let me know that it's good. But I find that Silent Hill fan games, and when I say Silent Hill fan games, I mean kind of like, you know, spiritual successors and the like, they have this problem where they, they fall in love with the aesthetic of Silent Hill without getting at the underlying mechanics. Like, if you look at each Silent Hill, there's shit kind of going, well, specifically 2 and 3, there's shit going on beneath the surface that generates the horror. Like, it's never just like, oh, look at this fucked up monster. Like, there's a reason, you know, all the monsters are so sexualized in Silent Hill 2. They got there's, subtext. Yeah, there's a reason all the monsters look like dicks in Silent Hill 3. You know, it's like, there's shit there. Semiotics, people. Semiotics, people. And unless you get that, what you get is a very surface Silent Hill experience. And unfortunately, like, I found this with Claire, and I also found it with the game Lone Survivor. Um... Mm. That was a, I think that's a probably a better game than Claire from what I've played, but it was also this 2D pixel Silent Hill, Silent Hill 2 thing. You wake up, you don't know what's happening, it's all very strange, there's, you know, characters that may or not actually exist, stuff like that. Mm. Which is a bit of a bummer, both those games, because I want more Silent Hill, and it's really tough to find games to fill that niche. Then I played Detention, and Detention is i could be wrong about this it's i think it's a taiwanese horror game yeah yeah yeah, it is and it's aesthetically not like silent hill at all does not borrow from the aesthetics um it's got this look to it and it's a really strange game because i think it looks awesome Mm -hmm. i didn't think it looked awesome with any footage i saw from the internet i thought it looked bad like like to me the characters look like diagrams of people Yes, they like, do. Like, like they look like the people that are in it, that are in manuals. Yeah, and they animate very stiff, and it just it doesn't look great. But I feel like YouTube compression is killing what this game actually looks like because there is a lot of really subtle atmospheric effects. I was gonna say I thought I had a kind of digital painted. Look it does. To it. it really does. And like, there's. St- I think they've done stuff like they've taken like a photograph of a tree. Then they've broken it into separate limbs and painted over it and then animated it with a puppet tool in a really subtle, effective way. Cool. cool. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so do, does it look like a vanillaware game a little bit? No. No? No, okay. not, not the same. The same technical skill is not there as a vanillaware game, but the kind of art direction is. And they're going for a particular very limited style, but they're nailing that style 100%. That's good. They're, they're using their resources. Yeah, to the, totally. Yeah, yeah, to yeah that's a great ability. way of putting it. Um, and what, what I was saying about the YouTube stuff is there's a lot of very subtle effects, like the kind of part, like dust particles and stuff mm-hmm. like that, that you're not going to see on YouTube that actually do help it. And so I really did not like what this game was doing aesthetically when I watched it online. But when I sat down in my dark apartment on, you know, my full TV or even just playing it on Switch and I had my headphones in and the sound design was there, it was great. Really immersive, really cool. But what I have really been digging about it so far, what I think is like really fucking cool and separates it from games like Lone Survivor and Claire is that it is absolutely, the fear The fear is absolutely generated from a real place. Uh, Taiwan has this weird history with China where they were kind of at war with China for a long time, very paranoid about getting taken over by China. And so you're this, I don't want to give too much away, you're this person in a school and the headmaster of the school is an ex-soldier who fought against uh, who fought against mainland China. And he's this like violent authoritarian. And I haven't seen him yet. I don't even know if he's in the game. But his kind of mark is everywhere. Like, he had the children terrified. Then one day you wake up at the school. No one's there. It's completely dark. And um, entities start appearing in the school. And you try and escape. And it's surrounded by a river of blood. And it's just really cool and really effective. And it's also it also gets points for, like, doing things in horror that only video games can do. 
there's there's a point quite early on where you have to do something to solve a puzzle and the moment it clicks in your head you have to do what you have to do you're like what i don't want to put my hand inside that thing it's way worse than that oh no yeah like you got to do something that people shouldn't do oh no yeah and like don't eat that um the writing's good, the story's good. I'm really intrigued to see what happens because I can tell this is going somewhere. And it's based on something very real. Like, this whole conflict and paranoia and, like, like kind of authority figures being fucked up. Like, mm. it's all it, it all kind of comes back to that. But then it's also based, a lot of it's ghosts and stuff in, like, Taiwanese myth. So you find, like, you find, like, a piece of paper that's telling you about this old Taiwanese ghost or, you know, this old Taiwanese legend... Um, and that's also the tutorial for how you deal with these monsters. That's cool. It's really cool. And it's on Switch. Highly recommended to people from what I've played so far. What price on Switch? If I remember right, it was like 10 to $12. Okay, that's a really good price. Cool. cool. Yeah. Yeah, actually the Switch eShop is having a good sale at the moment. So I think in the next episode, I'm going to be talking a lot about Switch Indies. So... I, I really, really like the Switch eShop library. Yeah, it's Switch great. is so good. Switch is so good. Neve, tell us about A Way Out. A Way Out is that co-op prison game. Yeah. If I could quote the director of the game. Go on. <laughs> Fuck the Oscars. Yeah, it's the <laughs> Fuck the Oscars guy like, from And Jeff Keighley was Awards. like, but that's what we're trying to do here. <laughs> it was so funny. His name is Joseph Fares. They uh, made the game Brothers, didn't they? Yeah. Two Sons. Which I, I love that yeah, game. Yeah, I, I think that's... Never played it. Oh, it's great. I love... It, it's really... It's done super well. Very... Hits hard. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Especially the... Don't care. <laughs> what, you, for as <laughs> long oh, as be, I've known beca- you, Neve, Because of the Spider Girl. Game. I just hate... Oh, Brothers, A Tale of Two Sons is like... Probably like the stupidest title I've ever heard. And then the bad guy is like his love interest that's a spider girl. It's so cliche right Women now. are evil, Neve. Neve, I think if you were an animal, you'd be a spider girl. Yeah, totally. I would, would. not. I'm not yeah. getting trapped in your web of lies. How do you know that's not what's happening? Yeah. She's manipulating me. I used to be like... <laughs> She's been enchanting us for 72 episodes. I, I used to be like this homophobic, like, uh, gun-toting, <laughs> meanie-weenie. But now I'm like a sensitive soft boy. Thanks to help of one lesbian. Yeah. One, <laughs> one lesbian spider woman. <laughs> yeah. Lesbian spider woman makeover. I'd watch Let's that. Let's find a boss is just queer eye for the straight guy. <laughs> oh no. Oh my god. <laughs> anyway. anyway, listen, good to hear that was good. On to our quick time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, is this game good? This is the I got this game because I wanted to play a game with my girlfriend. And this is a co-op game that you can play locally co-op or you can like split screen. Or you can play, like, um, play online. online. Yeah. yeah, that's really cool. And if you play online, only one of you needs to own the copy and another person can download the Which demo. Which is cool. And that and that's really cool. And, like, what it plays like is kind of like if, if your dad walked in when you were playing Life is Strange and went, why isn't there that for men <laughs> that are 40? That's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> did, did your dad Someone, say that to you? Yeah. <laughs> Where is my game? For me, the struggling white man. When is someone going to make a game for the white man? It's Far Cry 5. That is what A Way Out is. Okay. It's like a prison escape drama. There's two main characters, Leo and I think his name is Vincent. Two hunks. Two hunks. And you start off in what seems to be max security prison. And there's limited gameplay like Life is Strange. So you're just kind of walking this character through prison and you can press triangle on a few NPCs to get some flavor dialogue. All the flavor dialogue you get is hostile. Like everyone's just like, hey, you starting a fight? Fuck you. So like, you don't like, you don't really want to talk to people. That is talk. Um, the prison setup is so weird. Like, I don't know a lot about prison, but I know that prisoners don't usually have a belt with a belt buckle on all the time. No, because that's... No, you can't have that. Your You'll, laces are gone. Yeah, you wear a jumpsuit. Mm-hmm. No, not this game. The, pr- the, like, the prison warden, they wear a suit and tie. It's like they had a model of someone wearing a suit and tie and then put on like kind of a UK bobby hat on top of it. So the prison guards are just dressed really weirdly. 
And then any cliche you can imagine involved with a prison breakout, so hiding in a laundry basket. <laughs> That's part of the gameplay. You do, have to do, go. Do they red. incite a riot to distract? I'd say I'm not finished it yet, but I'm pretty sure that will happen. So, like, what I had to do as gameplay is I had to pick up folded laundry and like walk over to a laundry basket and put it in, and then get the laundry basket. And then Rebecca, who was playing with me, would get her character in the laundry basket, and I would push it into the next section. And they're handcuffed together. No, they're not no? handcuffed. together. I thought they were together. handcuffed together. No. Maybe at some stage, but not currently. Okay. But the gameplay is so minimal, it's literally turning a faucet, like turning and shining some, the other player shining a torch on the faucet for you to see to turn it. Uh, there is a bit where you have to go back to back and climb up a, a height, so you have to press things in time together. Just like Emperor's New Groove? Yeah, pretty much. Sweet. Yeah, actually exactly like Emperor's New Groove. Yeah, it's a good film. Um, How come okay, it's not in that breakdown list? Yeah, actually. <laughs> you guys done that? I just yeah. did it in my head. Who was your winner? Aladdin, but that's just a given. I think Aladdin's acceptable. I, I think there's a lot of films on that aren't acceptable that I've seen win. What's I, your winner? It would be Aladdin or Lion King. Okay. Yeah, for me it's either Tangled. Aladdin. Tang yeah, Tangle's really good. Uh, Tangle's really good, John. Okay. No, it's like fine. like it's like fine. It, it's fine. It's Those seed positions are bad. It's not my favorite, but Tangle's good. Yeah. Um. I. I. I for me, it's either Aladdin or Toy Story, but Aladdin just beats out Toy Story by a tiny bit. Fair. Um, anyway, a way Spirit out. Away. <laughs> that was pretty good. Spirit Away is a Disney film, and yeah. so is Princess totally. Mononoke. Okay. Yeah. It has the badge. A way out is like it's a fun enough co op game to play with someone. Kingdom Hearts 1, that's what wins for me. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, go on. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's just like, it's just so cliched. The writing's really bad. I like, think... one of the characters in prisons because he stole a diamond. <laughs> <laughs> that's like that Martin Lawrence film, yeah. Blue Streak. That's some shit. It's like that was the flavor text. Think, Stole a diamond. You're like, okay, cool. It was um, diamonds. I think Alex Navarro was talking about this in the Beast Cast. He was saying he gets the impression that this was made by a person who did not grow up in America, but watched a lot of American <laughs> yes. movies. He watched Prison Break. It, but it's like the writing techniques and the the rules of prison has come from TV, and not even that much. Like if you watch Orange is the Black and New the B New Black, you'd be like, I get the basic kind of. Just watch any Louis Thru documentary about prison. Yeah. He's made like ten of them, and they're like not max security ones. This one's meant to be a max security, the toughest guys, and they're like passing like screwdrivers through windows at each other. Like it's all so no. non plausible, but the whole point is a breakout. So if your whole breakout is badly done... So, okay, like, this is not a good depiction of prison life. Is it fun? Sometimes. It's kind of fun because it's bad. Okay. But you weren't expecting it to be bad, so you're just going with it? I, I know, I, was, I wasn't expecting it to be great. I bought it because I thought it'd be funny. But it's not even that funny. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it would be funny. <laughs> I think if you can play it, like, if you've someone... If you want to get a bottle of wine and do, like, this for 15 euro with your bestie, then yeah, go for How it. How long... How long is it? I haven't finished it yet, but I think it's around four hours. Fucking that man. sounds about the right same price. This. Mm -hmm. Same price as Kirby and f funnier. I don't know. It's it's a hard recommend. If you want to see someone who doesn't know anything about prison write a prison breakout story, then there you go. I know. That sounds like it could be a pretty fun time for me and Michelle. Yeah. No, I think it's a good couple game. <laughs> go for it. Okay. Good stuff. Let's say we move on to some... Quick time events! Hyperlight Drifter coming to Switch. That's great. That's good. Good game. Um, do you guys remember the video? Okay, so when Hyperlight Drifter was getting kickstarted, two of the tiers and like they hit it were the PS Vita and the Nintendo Wii U. And the game got released on PC first, and it got released on PS4 and Xbox One. And then there was nothing. And people were like, any day now, it's going to be out on the handheld system. I think I was like, I'm going to wait for Vita. I'd say, yeah, because I was like, I bet it'll play real good in the Vita. And <laughs> then um, I got I got my backer email and they showed the creator of Hyperlight Drifter. And he just looked so sad. And he had like like purple, like like or like pink, then purple, then black bags under his eyes. Like he had a gradient of just lack of sleep on his face. And he was like... I'm really sorry to tell you this, but I'm gonna have to cancel the Vita and Wii U versions. We got the Vita version kind of running, but only at 15 frames per second and it chugs a lot. 
the Wii U version, we never even got a dev kit. We don't know how to make it on the Wii U. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. And he was like, look, I'm really sorry. You can get refunded if you exclusively wanted it on the Wii U for whatever reason. I mean, like, that's the way to do that. Yeah, or, you know, I'm just, I, I'm not doing it. I'm sorry. I also refuse to believe there is anyone who owns a Wii U that doesn't own any other platforms. Like, yeah. games. <laughs> like what kind of psychopath is that? <laughs> Just some guy who really likes, um, well, no, they're all on the Switch now. I'm trying to think of, like, a really, like, the guy who likes Devil's Third. Like, that's you, Brian. <laughs> I own that game, yeah, but I own the Switch. I don't. I, th I think that's cool, it's coming to the Switch. I might buy it again for the Switch. It, I, 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 I think that game works out. I would happily plink away at that game on holidays. Yeah, I, I, I think that would look great as a portable game. Man, that game plays, like, phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Square Enix opening new studio, Luminos Productions. Here you go. Let's, let's apply there. This is the um, head of the Final Fantasy XV team and most of the Final Fantasy XV team. Um, the goal is to make new new IP AAA titles. Um, the exact quote is, developing new AAA titles and bringing innovative game and other entertainment content to a global audience. We get emails to the contrary every time I say this. Final Fantasy XV is fucking bad, and it's so bad that I don't play it for months, and then I wake up one morning being like, that game was terrible. And I think this keeps happening to me, and so I do think I have to return and finish it. Like, I have to. Yeah. Because I need... That game... That game is so fucking... The fucking bit with Titan, where he's just fucking there, and everyone's just like, oh, it's a giant fucking Earth man. And then they fucking go down into Titan, and... Then Gladios and Noctis is there, and Gladios just starts grabbing Noctis and just being like, You can't be sad, bro! You can't be sad! Meanwhile, there's this giant grinning giant in the background, and nothing makes any sense. I don't know what that fucking game was. But John, there's a flying car at the end. Okay, yeah, so... And Cup Noodle. Anyway, they have a studio now. <laughs> cool, well... They're making new games. I can't wait. I, I, do you know what? Good luck. No, fuck I, you. Yeah. No, no, I, like, I'm gonna wish you. I, no, I, fuck you. I, 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 I want to see what they make. If they're like free from the tether of whatever Final Fif Fantasy 15 became, they will make great stuff. But like that was just a mess of advertising and reuse and no vision. I think, like, okay, Final Fantasy's advertising was not good. If you drop that game, if you wiped my mind and dropped that game into my lap, I'd be like, this is shit. Yeah, it's not great. It's bad on. It's bad as a story. It's bad as an RPG. It has bad combat. It's just bad. It has bad sound design. My dog would leave the room. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> like every time Prompto shot its gun, she would get up and run away. Every, in fairness, I did that whenever Prompto did fucking anything. Fuck this. Um. Oh god, that game's so bad. I still just remember watching the cuts, like. Watching Noctis talk about how sad that his how sad he was that his dad was dead. Meanwhile, they all played out the like who farted animation. <laughs> who farted? Yeah. No job. Ignis. Ignis farted all the time. Wait, yeah. Yeah. Mm, interesting. Video game Hall of Fame. Oh, video game Hall of Fame gets its 2018 nominees. I didn't see this at all. Yeah, what's this? I have it here. So the video game Hall of Fame has been going for a few years, and it's organized by the Strong National Museum of Rochester, New York. So they put out a list of games every year that people vote on, and one of them gets inducted into the video game Hall of Fame. Cool. So I thought I would list them: Asteroids, Call of Duty, Dance Dance Revolution, Final Fantasy VII, Half Life, John Madden Football, King's Quest. Metroid, Minecraft, Miss Pac-Man, Space War, Tomb Raider. Can only one of these win? Yeah, but they get to be nominated again. So Final Fantasy was nominated, Seven was nominated last year what as well. What won last year, I wonder? I can't remember what won last year. I probably assume that they have like Mario Brothers is already in there. Maybe Wii Sports is already in there, shit like that. It's so weird, like I don't know who's running it and what so the, they only how they quantify one game it. a year? Yeah, yeah. So, by but the time like we're all a... dead, there's only going to be 50 video games in this thing. It's not a great system. Let's just say they have very little floor space. Yeah, like, do they just keep, like, is Zelda or Ocarina of Time already in it? Are they just going through, like, Edge's, like, top 100 games ever made and just been like, this one? I buy that magazine every time mm -hmm. Edge release it. It's good reading. 
it's really fun. Crackdown. It's kind of funny how like a lot of people have in their head this list of like 20 best games. But if you talk to anyone like, I don't know, 10 years younger, they would have a completely different list. And it's these two vying kind of people trying to get a game inducted into a hall of fame. Well, you, There's you a know, lot of airports. Well, like, you, you, know, you know how like the American National Library have like a film congress thing where they have like films that they deem like relevant mm -hmm. to like the American cause or whatever. I'm uh, just crashing that. No, no, because they rejected Crash when it won Best Picture. They were like, nope, yep. we, we shouldn't have done that. That's the right choice. Yeah. So I don't know who gets to pick or what, but I just thought it was an interesting list. And it's so like, that's so broad. Like, how do you pick? Yeah. And like, why does like Metroid beat out Final Fantasy VII, but then Asteroid beats out everything? It's so broad. Like, yeah, you're right. Like, it's so broad. It kind of, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Though. That's. Just like, well, what do you, well, well, what do the people on the commission like? Because that's all it kind of is then. Yeah. So I guess, like, to the strong National Museum play in Rochester, New York, your system's bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have no doubt you listen to this podcast. Um, they, do, they do. Yeah, for sure. And uh, that needs some work. But if you need uh, some gaming experts, some hardcore capital G gamers, your friends at the Less Fighter Boss cast can help you out. Yeah. We have very strong opinions on Bloodborne. We do, and we thought Mario Odyssey was kind of dumb. Mm -hmm. We have our own Hall of Fame anyway. Yeah, the Let's Fight a Boss hard work, Hall of Hard Work and Success, the only one that matters. Do I don't know what's in there anymore. Grow Homes in there. Grow Homes <laughs> in there. Uh, Fire Emblem's in there. Near Automata got in, yeah. I'm pretty sure. If Bloodborne's not in there, I guess it is no, now. No, Bloodborne should go in Yeah, there, I think yeah. Bloodborne kicked the doors open and went mm -hmm. in. Okay, cool. Because <laughs> Neve had never played Bloodborne, so we couldn't put it in. Oh yeah, because it's a game all three of us have had to play. Yeah, but now she's like, played yeah. it. Yeah, and yeah. I think one of us has to beat it. Yeah. I would like to induct Bloodborne into the Let's Fight a Boss Hall of Hard Work and Success. We have, an, we have another hall for bad games, and I can't remember what that was called. I don't think it was a hall, I think it was a box. It was a box. I thought search. it was a bag of shit. Yeah, I think it might have been a hole. Yeah. <laughs> the, the whole of disappointment. Anyway, no one can see what's down there. But this yeah. is Final Fantasy 15 and whatever. And Firewatch. Is. Yeah, Firewatch. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. That was that made me the happiest when I saw our subreddit and like one of the things was just like four people or one of the rules was just like do not talk about Firewatch. Okay, so I, I, I guess it was two years ago now when Firewatch came out and I don't know who listened back then but who's listening now. If someone is still listening from back then, God bless you. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, by the way, we don't like Firewatch. And we Still. don't want to. We don't want to talk about. Oh no, it. guys, we can't do this. No, we can't, we can't mention good. Firewatch. We can't mention you The guys Last of might, Us. We can't mention. You guys should maybe play The Way Out. A Way Out. It's kind of bad enough to be a Firewatch. Yeah, it, re it really, really reminded me of Firewatch when you were describing <laughs> yeah. it. Where oh, it was like think that. I, I think I thought that that's a, what the way it would be. I thought the fire. I, I thought Firewatch was going to be good. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. <laughs> Dragon Quest XI comes to PS4 and Steam in September. That's awesome. Cyberpunk 2077. <laughs> uh, wait, back to back to Dragon Quest. I'm really excited for Dragon Quest. Me too. There's no news on the... Uh, wait, there is news. There's no 3DS version, so that's not getting a port. It's just to PlayStation and Steam. Originally, they had said that it was for the NX, because this is... Before the switch was announced mm -hmm. but they haven't said anything about that right now this sounds like a really good localization so english voice english voice acting of course um camera mode which is so good in anything and in an rpg i'm super excited to have it in an rpg hey I, I like camera mode now like like menu updates and ui updates it sounds like it's pretty robust and i'm excited for it it's cool because like um i pl the first dragon quest i played was sentinels of the starry sky is that nine or eight i think it's nine i think it's nine, yeah, and, nine. And, and it's on the ds yeah, yeah. it's the one with the train in the yeah, sky yeah, yeah. it's one of my favorite rpgs i've ever played brilliant absolutely love it going back and trying to play a on the playstation 2 real rough and i think there's an updated version of it out on something else but like you hit attack five seconds later your character attacks like that's like it just stalls for a little bit and then your character attacks and i'm sure if you played that game in the playstation 2 era you didn't know boy do you know now like it is kind of agonizing and it's a shame because i love 
the character designs from that game. I think um, all the characters are really cute. But I'm very much excited about this one. Do you think Toriyama got paid once to design the slime and never got paid again? Because that thing is super iconic. No, his, his designs are like all over those games. Yeah. Like there's a big crossover between a lot of the weirdos that appear in early Dragon Ball and the Dragon Quest monsters. Do you think he still designs them? Or do you think it's done by like... I was reading an interview with him recently where he was talking about how like... <laughs> someone like, like you know I've talked yeah, to yeah, like he's probably got a copycat team you know the way he's so apathetic about everything someone was like how do you feel about your you know the working on the Dragon Quest games and he's like well I didn't know what video games were when I started <laughs> and if I'd known it was so much work I wouldn't have done it that's so funny I'd say right now there's such a rich design bible made up that anyone could step in and make something yeah I think so I, I'd say I'd say you're right Brian he has a lot of like people yeah. doing it yeah uh, I think the girl looks really really hot the main character, the girl. Mm, totally. Yeah, this was something we were talking about before we were recording. Neve, what do you think? Just a, just, 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 just a certain femininity that... It's a Trunks 2 pint o character, like... 2 pint. 2 pint o 2 pint o Moira. Oh, Jesus. That was really mean. <laughs> <laughs> it was not. It's so funny when someone gets... I, I feel. I feel like we've been a little too nice this podcast. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah, I think it's time to make someone cry. <laughs> oh. Anyway, Dragon Quest. The main character is a boy. The main character is totally a boy. Yeah, that was a little humor there for you. Yeah, that's it's a funny podcast, everyone. (laughs) (laughs) This is where you go to laugh. Oh, Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven. Is this made by The Witcher lads? Yes. Yeah, I just put this down because they, there's a rumor that there's a character creator and a class system in that, and I think that's really cool. You know, it's also not good. The Witcher three, <laughs> but like in The Witcher, like you have to play as him, don't you? Yeah, there's a yeah. you play Geralt. It's his yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. his story. So the, yeah, that, that that's real cool. If you if if, if if it's like an Avatar thing where you can yeah, be and, like, and like those guys can make a game. Yeah, obviously, like people fucking love The Witcher. I, mm-hmm. I wasn't, I never could get into it myself, but obviously people like it. That Maybe. level of writing. Well, this is the thing. I don't know. Like it'll be interesting to see if they pull it off because The Witcher was a book series, so all these characters were fleshed out and developed. I think Cyberpunk is like an original IP of yeah. theirs. And even then, like a lot of the writing for Witcher, I don't know how many quests of that I played where it's like person A gives you quest, you go off, you find person B, something has happened to them, but actually person A was the one at fault. It's morally grey. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. A bleak world. <laughs> Do you spare him or put him in the shackles? I was going to debate that and I was like, no, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, like, they're real good at sci-fi f- or uh, fantasy, so, or, yeah, like... The characters always feel a bit more fleshed out than other games. Like, like they feel like book characters, I guess, where you're just like... Yeah, totally. Huh. Anyway, character creator, hope we get some cool hair. This this has been in development for like a decade, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. They've never they've shown like there's like one piece of concept art, isn't there? And it mm-hmm. looks like it's a it, girl. Yeah. Yeah, and it looks like kind of awesome. Blade Runnery. <laughs> oh, <I> girls. <laughs> like the girl and dragon <laughs> quest. <laughs> um, uh, before we leave this section, PS4 is dropping in price by another hundred euro in Europe, and I think that's cool. Is it time to dive back in? I Eve? think it might be. <laughs> time to buy back up. I really. Miss VR, it's so fucking cool, guys. Um, I, I tried it the, once over Christmas and I didn't the, like it. I was listening to the most recent Dad and Sons podcast, and they really went. They they made a very compelling argument for why VR is actually cool. It's like it feels like you know those first few games you ever play in your life, and you're like, "Wow, I can't believe this is happening." It feels like that. It has that sense of wonder, even if it's like not the most amazing shit is actually happening. Yeah. They were saying that like weird things was happening them with like because they were seeing everything in scale, it was like a lot more easy to be empathetic. And like I've heard I've heard this same story a bunch of times how like someone, you know, is like doing Google Street View and they decide to fly off into space, then they see the earth in scale and it's just like Whoa. <laughs> Humanity. We are just Which which is something that happens to astronauts, so there is something to be said to being kind of in there in the moment, like whether it's like kind of janky or not, that's another thing, but it is cool. Yeah, yeah, totally. What's we move on to some emails? Mm-hmm. 
Brian, what we got? Okay, uh, this first one is from Trash Bastard. Uh, is there a piece of art or media that you feel you discovered at the perfect time in your life? Uh, he cites FLCL uh, because he was the same age as now. What I would not give to watch FLCL as a teenager. Yeah, because he's like 11, 12 years old in that. And that's like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Some things only work nearly in that context. Like I've always gone tried to watch FLCL. I kind of feel the same. I can't connect to it at all. Like, like I, I get it. I understand why someone would. I did not have like a personal, and maybe that's the kind of thing I will break through it if I rewatch it because I do want to rewatch it. But mm. yeah, I think I watched FLCL when I was eighteen, and I was a late bloomer, so I it just about reached me. But yeah, Street Fighter the Two, the animated movie. It was, was a big one for me. Um, it kind of came at this time when I was like really figuring out that I loved like anime. And so I was always like, I always liked Street Fighter, but then when I discovered the Street Fighter Alpha games, which are all like some of the most beautiful fucking art, like, and I was like, oh my God, so Street Fighter is like anime. And then I found out there was a movie and then the, the, the Chun-Li shower scene was pretty cool. Like for a fucking like 11 year old boy, Shit was mind blowing. You think my parents knew that was in there? No fucking way. Cool. It was. And um, I really like that movie. To this day, it just reminds me of a simpler time when I didn't fully know what anything was and everything was full of, full of potential. And it's totally fine that the fa- last shot of that film is a freeze frame that Corn plays over. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. Um, to go back to Kirby. I was nine years old when I found out what Kirby was. And that that was perfect timing. I think when you're nine, just before you hit 10, which is like a big step in your life, I feel, with double digits. I think that's kind of like the last year you feel like 100% as a kid. Because I think when you're 10, like you've got like aunts and uncles going, oh, you're going to be a teenager soon. But it's, I, I, think, I still think you're a kid when you're nine. Yeah, you, s- you start to figure out, figure shit out at 10. Yeah, and so I, 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 I can see what the, uh, I can see what Trash Bastard here is going for with FLCL by turning 11, 12. Mm. Mm. But I just think like Kirby and that innocence at that time was just what I needed as like a final goodbye to being like a completely, you know, blissfully unaware kid. Totally, yeah. Um, mine was like always be Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet. Uh, I had a sleepover with a lot of girl friends, and oh, no. we were really in love with Leonardo DiCaprio from in, from Titanic. Yeah, we. But Titanic wasn't out in VHS, only Romeo and Juliet. But Romeo was in this, like Leonardo DiCaprio. So we rented it, and we were watching it, and all the all of us were in love with Romeo. And it was the scene where Juliet shoots herself and the girls just kept playing it back being like, yeah, she's dead. Now Romeo can be ours. And they just kept repeating the scene of like Claire Danes as Juliet shooting herself in the head over and over and just laughing at it. And I was just remember sitting there being like, oh no, I'm gay. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's amazing. That was the moment because like I didn't like I didn't love Romeo. I loved the girl who was dying over and over and over again. It was a very enlightening moment. That's incredible because for like four years, I've heard you talk about that fucking movie. (laughs) And you've never told me like that part about it. Claire Danes is so good. Wow. So after that, I rented it from the video hut and the guy who worked there was called Patsy and he only had one arm. So he used to open the VH cases with one arm and we all used to do it. And he used to, like, it was a whole thing. It was this legend of Patsy, the guy with one arm in the town. He was kind of like a pirate. And he was just like, you keep renting this. You have it. (laughs) And I was like, okay. So I got my VHS copy of Romeo and Juliet from Patsy. Patsy sounds all right. That's super cool. Super old dude. That's a great film. How, how did he lose the arm? No one knows. It was oh. the mystery of Patsy. He just owned a video shop in a really small town that only had VHS and Silent Hill games. 
Maybe he got his pa- arm. Patsy sounds like he knew it was fucking up. Yeah, Patsy it, was cool. It'd be cool if he got his arm trapped in like video, like like an actual. <laughs> <laughs> video, I give my life to VHS. Check it out, Patsy. <laughs> this new industrial grade VHS. And, like he tried to rewind the tape, but it just sucked his arm off. It was great because you would give horror films to ten year olds. <laughs> oh, I I love. Videos. I saw the Wishmaster at twelve. I was yeah. like, what? Because like you know how you go to like Chartbusters and the other ones like or yeah like the the more uh, the more franchisey ones, and they had like you know systems in place to prevent you. But the ones that were run by like you know very very independent ones, they'd be like, yeah, you know what? It's cool you're watching RoboCop at the age of five. Yeah, that was the idea. Like, there was no blockbuster or extra vision here. It was just Patsy, and he was just like, oh, you like the weird shit, huh? <laughs> here you go, yeah, kids. In the back. <laughs> yeah. What else we got, Brian? Okay, uh, this next one is from Adam, and he wants to ask, do you guys have or like pets? Do we? My parents own a cat and a dog who's... I guess developments I am I'm invested in. I, I like those little guys a lot. I got a little cat who I used to call Blitzkrieg, but then Nazis came back, so I stopped calling him that. And his name is Bert now. Um, Jesus. And then I it's have true. yeah, Blitzkrieg was a really fun, ironic name like seven years ago. Thanks for that, you fucking assholes. Um, you ruined his cat. Yeah, and do it again. Yep, yep, and. Um, I also have a little dog named Montgomery, and he's a tiny coward. He's so small. He's really small. I think he's an adult dog when he's still a puppy. Yeah, he's like, he's like, <laughs> you know when you're like, I can't wait to see what he looks like when he's grown up. He's like four now, and he's just, he's just a tiny puppy. <laughs> Neve, um, you don't like animals. Really don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I love animals. I have uh, two dogs. I have Piper, who is my... Um, Best friend. Cr- yeah, my best friend, my lurcher cross. She's a whippet crossed with probably a saluki, and she's very skinny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She looks hilarious. She, it's like a peanut attached to pipe cleaners. Yeah, she's so cold. <laughs> she's super cute. She's so cold. Her fur is so light and stuff. You got to put her in a hoodie at Christmas, and you're like, Piper, you want to get into your jumpy? She fucking loves it. <laughs> she really does want to get into it. My my dog Tiggy used to be like that. She was just super into wearing clothes. <laughs> like you'd bring out a little. I, I used to dress her as a little samurai chef, a little sushi chef, and sh- I'd bring it out, and she'd hurry as good and she'd wag, and she'd be like, yeah, yeah, put it on. <laughs> yeah. And then the other dog. Uh, and Dash is um, a Shiba Inu who's like three years old and just bold little dude yeah just just a bad batch of bread i like i like dash i feel like we have a kind of we get it okay. he's the type of dog who makes eye contact with strangers and some dude actually tried to fight him once he was like what the fuck are you looking at <laughs> wow yeah looking at a cool dog that's what you're looking at jesus uh, yeah and then like family pets anything uh we've always have dogs i had rats in college we had like your your your, your, your mom has a cat now doesn't my you? mom has a cat called millie there was like birds there's a duck there's a chicken there is a donkey called muffin there was a cow called jackie so brian <laughs> yeah let's take our next email no i want to talk about brian do you have any pets i have a pet hedgehog called how, long, how long have you had a pet hedgehog <laughs> three days what is his name Biscuit. He's an African pygmy hedgehog and he's really, really cool. He's only eight weeks old and he's tough as fuck. Um, he is the size of a tennis ball and he'll let you know. And he sleeps 20 hours a day because he's got to grow up and fight me someday. And he poops 18. Yeah. I met the young man. A very determined little character. Yeah. Uh, I have... I'm, I, at the moment I'm toilet training him because I know at a young age you can sort of like you can't completely toilet train them but you can tell them like look I'm going to put your poos over here so maybe do the rest of them over there and do you know what he's making the best attempt possible he peed on three quarters of the of, of the of the toilet area and I, I, I chalk that off as a huge success it is yeah yeah and they're really interesting because like there's there's uh, people at work who, have, who keep them as pets as well and Growing up, I've only ever had cats. They're kind of like cats, but not really. I don't know. They're, they're just a really strange animal. Are they just like a spiky guinea pig? Kind of, yeah. Well, I, I felt like from the little bit I met of Biscuit, 
he had maybe a little more personality than I am used to guinea pigs having. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, 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 think, I think, so. think that will only develop as he gets older. Yeah, but we got him because we're at work most of the time. And we don't have time for something like a guinea pig. And I love guinea pigs. They're my favorite animal in the whole world. Hedgehogs are my second favorite animal in the world, which is very strange. Oh, I don't tell him that. Yeah. That's oh, I'm not <laughs> fucking telling him. That. I'm telling him he's my little silver trophy. <laughs> little silver trophy. Um, but guinea pigs are very social and very, very dependent. And they're awake during the day and we're at work during the day. Whereas this guy's nocturnal and loves to be left alone. So suits us just fine. Doesn't make any noise. Just part of the furniture. That's real love right there when well, you describe it as being But then like our family picture. cats were always described as like cushions we fed. Cause that's They just sat on the couch. Like sometimes you weren't sure if you were sitting on a cushion or a cat. Dogs are so needy. They really make their presence known. Yeah, I don't think I'd be able to mind a dog. I just, I, I, I'd be, I'd get stressed out and I'd start crying. I, I think, I think any, any, anybody who owns a dog is kicking ass. Yeah, your life, your life becomes part, the dog, the dog is your life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, then we have one last email uh, from Johan, and this is aimed at you, Neve. so do you want to take it away? Because I don't know how to say this, it's a Japanese oh. word. So Johan was on my Twitter, stop creeping. Don't stop creeping, never stop creeping. <laughs> no, please stalk me of Twitter. Um... And he saw that I'd gotten my hands on some Takarazuka DVDs. And what John was saying about wrestling, about like finding something that... No, Neve, this is about who I am. No, this is about who I am. No, you don't <laughs> understand. Like, okay, like finding something that is just perfectly for you, that has existed kind of in the background of everything you've loved before, but you you didn't for some reason you kind of vaguely knew about it but didn't approach it maybe you knew because you'd love it too much you know like once i went in there was no coming out there's going to be a post like takarazuka neve and a pre takarazuka neve it was like that you know it's like I, I i know it exists now so new japan for me was a hundred times that book one <laughs> but now you're awake it's a fucking thousand times that so like the biggest criticism I have from literally everything in existence, like even this moment, is that it would be better with more women. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all women. And Takarazuka is so hard for me. It's all women all the time. Okay, so this is <laughs> the, 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 this, this, this is a Japanese all-female acting group. It's musical theater. Musical theater. Mm -hmm. It's all women, all Jap like Japanese musical theater, and they do. Shakespeare, Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet, they do anime, they do, they did Lupin the Third. They, they do did video games, they uh, did, did a Phoenix Wright. They did Phoenix Wright. Um, and they just put on musical versions of these. It is impossible to buy. <laughs> I like, I found this thing and I was like, great, I'd love to watch it. It's impossible. There's none on YouTube. There's, if there is clips, it's like three minutes and it's like fuzzy as shit. And this thing is existent since like 1913. Like this is a dynasty of female actors in theater. It's just super hard to watch. So I went on this whole spree of trying to find it. I went to like fans reached out to me and they put me in contact with buyers in Japan that will go around to stores and try and source DVDs and you know, they'll give you a price and get them. So that's like the only way to really watch them. The other way is there's some fan subbers who do really, really good work. And that's where I got to see a lot of the stuff. And that's where it gets kind of murky. Yeah. But also, if it's not available and these fan subbers, like, you'll find them if you if you look for them. Um, go to the wiki is what I'll say. But these fan subbers, the way they do things is they don't take money, they don't take tips. I wanted to tip them because I thought it was a cool service. But they take performances of Takarazuka that have aired on broadcast Japanese TV and they subtitle them. So it's not new ones that are available on DVD or Blu-ray, so they don't feel like they're eating into any kind of revenue. Mm. It's kind of older performances that would have been broadcasted. Neve, what's your favorite Takarazuku so far? Um, I watched Romeo and Juliet without subtitles because I understood the story and that was fucking great. It was so good. See, I watched Ibushi versus Nakamura without subtitles and that's how I felt. 
Okay. <laughs> it's like, this, I didn't need it. You could just Yeah, like, you tell. just know. Yeah, you it's just, just know. a performance. Mm-hmm. Do, do they do Romeo and Juliet in Japanese? Yeah, it's Japanese. There's singing. There's dancing. Tybalt gets way more screen time, which he's always needed. Um, it's just like they like they it's it's always romantic and it's always high drama and like people are like you kind of wonder why someone would be into Shakespeare because you're like Shakespeare it's boring I learned it in school Shakespeare is just like soap opera it's just Game of Thrones it's just early TV it's melodrama and that's why it kind of stands the test of time so this is like Shakespeare being sung by a cast of beautiful Japanese women and I'm just like yeah, and they're playing the male roles, they're playing the female roles, it's just cool. There's dancing, there's singing, there's costumes, there's set design. It's like perfect cape movements. You were saying this goes back to like the 19, 1913? Yeah. How did it start, I wonder? It's It was like set up by, I don't really... Was it because women weren't allowed on stage? Maybe. It's like set up by like men set it up and run the company. Huh. As like, but they had it was a novelty act with women. I or think some it was shit? just like it, like there was women actors who wanted to do it, and it was set up out of that. But it was kind of these men had the power to. I guess like if you it. were a serious woman actor in 1913, your your option for roles was probably limited. Yeah, yeah. So this was kind of like it's kind of you live there. Like there's it's broken into troops, like four troops, like Moon, Flower, Cosmos, and stuff like that. And there's about cosmos. There's about 70 women in each group and they like you start there really long and you live throughout it and you go up from kind of background roles to like foreground roles like you kind of work for um, your way up throughout it and you can kind of retire out of it or you can stay up until some of actresses are 80 years old and stuff. Jesus. So it's just this entire dynasty you're watching and you're watching people's careers from like 18 till they're 40 or something. You know what I mean? True musicals. And it's just, it's really impressive. For some reason, I didn't know it existed. I'm glad it does. If you want to know how to watch it, the best advice I can give you is to go to the Takarazuka Wikipedia. There's a lot of information on how you can do it legally or not so legally, if that's what you want to do. You will be probably buying DVDs through buyers online, which I did and it worked and it was cool. It sucks that it's limited, but it does sound a little bit like, I guess, back in the heyday when like things were very difficult to find, it always felt really good when you found something. Yeah. Is there an element to that at all or is it just frustrating? There is. It's kind of cool that you're like, whoa, it's this thing that people know about, but it's super hard to get into. And you have to like search it out. And you have to search it out. But the flip side of that is, because of that, the fandom can be really intense. And I actually got a few messages some from weirdos in the fandom telling me I wasn't engaging in it the proper way. That's... That's when you know you're really in the shit. Yeah, so I was just like, I'm gonna block you. <laughs> I don't think I've ever gotten a message telling some someone telling me like, you're engaging with this piece of media the wrong way and me being like, oh! Uh, like after the fucking Dragon Ball video, the amount of people messaged me just being like, dude, you need to give the sub with the original Japanese music a shot. And it's like, dude, I experienced this shit as a teenager I loved it more than anything, and I'm not even going to rewatch that version. I don't give a shit about your version. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like that. It's if you're like, one of those people oh. who messaged me, I'm sorry, but I mean, fucking come on. Like, yeah, come on, come you on. shouldn't need people to experience media the way you experience it. That's kind of how I feel about Takarazuka. There were some people in the fandom who were really helpful and really lovely. There's other people, and it's like, you know how hard it is to get into this. Mm-hmm. It's like, stop chasing people off with weird rules. I guess they're just yeah. being elitist. It's so pedantic. Yeah, it's really like gatekeepering. It's like, yeah. hey, you can't like it unless you do this, this, and this thing. And I'm like, no. Fuck you, buddy. Yeah, fuck off. Yeah, I can like this thing. <laughs> yeah. And that means we're equal. There was you. one guy who messaged me and it was just like, oh, you like the Bruce Faulkner music, cringe. And it's like, dude, I'm a, I'm a fucking 30 year old man who listens to Linkin Park. You cannot make me cringe over my fucking musical choices. Are you going to put Linkin Park in one of your videos? I'm going to put it at the end of this. Fuck. Nice. Yeah, yeah, let's do mm-hmm. this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah, I'm I'm super glad you have discovered that, Neve. It's, it's great to be... It's always fun when like you just find this thing where it's like, yeah, I fucking love this without condition and 
it's just nice that that can still be a thing. Yeah. Um, one thing I did want to address, we've actually gotten a few emails in the last little while about, I guess, just about like people asking for advice, particularly like trans people coming out and stuff. And we've all kind of talked it over separately. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave, I, uh, I have a friend of mine who's trans and I asked them for some resources and I'm going to leave those as links in the description. I don't particularly feel comfortable giving personal advice, especially like people coming out to their family and stuff, just because I haven't lived it. I don't know what's involved and it sounds like a very serious thing and not something I think I or I guess any of us really feel mm-hmm. too yeah. qualified to talk about. We could talk about the teenager aspect of it, but that's about it. Yeah. Like the only thing I'd say is like, make sure you're safe, you know, yeah. um, you will like, especially if you're a young teenager, you will definitely be at a point in your life where you can be who you want to be. And I'm sure that will be awesome. But like, you know, if you're growing up and if, you know, maybe, you know, your family don't share the same values as you, just make sure you're safe. Make sure you always have a roof over your head, no matter what. And uh, things will definitely get better. Um, those links will be in the description. Yeah. Cool. That's emails, which means normally we'd be moving on into our loot drop but we actually got one extra little bit this time, and that is that the Let's Fight a Boss is starting a little Patreon. The main reason we're doing this is like, we've gotten a lot of requests. We get a lot of messages, people like asking, when, when are we going to do a Patreon? When are we going to do a Patreon? And I could have taken it or leave it for the longest time, because as everyone knows, I already have one, but like, Brian and Eve do a ton of good work on this and people seem to want to support it and I don't think we give a shit how much we get or anything but it just seems like okay if people want us to do it we'll set one up we have established a few little oh it's three books a month that's that's pretty much it Mm -hmm. yeah and the money goes back into the podcast yeah we'd be using it just like we'd like a proper podcast set up because we're all still recording over the one mic in our apartments but um and i i I know, I know sometimes that's a, a minor complaint from people that it'd be cool if we each had a mic yeah so yeah, that would like so that. It, it would be cool to have that as our, our goal i guess i i'd be i'd be super happy if we could upgrade yeah and so um there's going to be a few little rewards and i'll let people check out the patreon if you want but the main the main one to know is you're going to get access to the let's fight a boss black tapes And what this is, is a collection of episodes from the Dark Ages, from the early days of Let's Fight a Boss. It is not every episode, and the only reason it's not every episode is because we have genuinely lost a bunch of them. Yeah, we have. We don't know where they are. Yeah, I think I used to, I used to edit this on my, my old computer, my old job, (laughs) and since then I left and then the server got wiped, so they're definitely gone. But we really thought that one true. Oh yeah, we sure did. But now there is, there is like, there is a lot of, I, I don't know how many episodes. Over 20. Over 20. Mm-hmm. Okay. And including like the first like three or four. So you can just hear that like very first E3 episode. E3 2015. E3 2015. And like back then we were recording on an iPad, but using the microphone that's built into the iPad. Oh my God. Yeah. I don't know why anyone wants to listen to this, but people all like whenever we refer to the dark ages people are always like i wish i could hear that this so before we had sound effects as well before yeah. we had sound effects but the first episode we just start fucking talking i don't think <laughs> we even introduce ourselves <laughs> the first episode isn't even called let's fight a boss it's just three people talking at a mic yeah we didn't come up with the name until afterwards yeah and then after that podcast i was like what do you guys think about the let's fight a boss cast and then we did another one like two weeks later and it just sort of fell into a groove. Yeah. I expected to do maybe eight or nine episodes and stop, but here we are with an actual modest following. Yeah. It's cool. But uh, like, yeah, but like it, 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 it did take like over a year for us to feel like confident about keeping yeah. them alive. Totally. And like, I cannot vouch for the quality of those episodes, mm-hmm. uh, but if people want to hear the development, totally go for it. Um, the other thing you get is access to the Let's Fight a Boss Discord. And um, some of you might be might might already be aware of the like Super Eye Patch Wolf Discord. That's usually a pretty fun time. It is totally the best way to reach us if you want to reach us. Um, but yeah, that should I look forward to that developing into a fun little community. And then the final thing is a very special digital hug. You will feel it 
deep down in your bones. If you don't feel it, just search harder. You mm -hmm. will be an official member of the Let's Fight a Boss, Boss Rush. That's true. That's true. So, uh, regardless of, like, if you, you know, if Patreon isn't your thing for whatever reason, nothing is going to change for you. Every episode that is out will always be out. Every episode that's coming out will always be coming out. It, you, you will not feel this at all. Mm -hmm. But if you do feel like, you know, kicking in a book too, helping out your old buddies, let's fight a boss. Yeah. We'd There's a now it. way to do it. There's now a way to do yeah. it. Yeah, it's just that we're getting a lot of positive feedback and we want to push this in... Baby off this bridge. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah let's push the, the baby off this bridge. That's yeah. the euphemism, isn't let's it? Fuck that baby up. Yeah. <laughs> And with that, let's say we move into our loot drop. This is the section of the podcast where we drop our loot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's usually a YouTube channel. Yeah. Uh, yep. This channel, this time I want to drop a show buckle. Show buckle. If you want to get into New Japan wrestling, show buckle is the absolute best way to do it. Just a very politely spoken young man who really appreciates the finer points of Japanese wrestling. Um, he has a great video. He has a video on the golden numbers. It's very good. But my favorite of his is chronicling. It's the one I talked about earlier. Uh, Okada versus Tanahashi and the battle for New Japan's ace. He just takes you through a series of like six matches these guys have. And it's riveting. Like these men are so special. They are so important. They're the greatest storytellers on the planet. Nice. Brian, what'd you got? Uh, I have a YouTube channel called Pause and Select. Do you know, do you know, do you know this channel? I do. Yeah. Yeah, um, my girlfriend Rebecca told me about it. And she was like, "Yeah, like this is this is like different to other anime and manga channels. Where like this guy is super cerebral, and I don't know if it's for me or not. But I'm just very impressed with like the branding and the thumbnails and how he makes his videos visually stimulating. He really gives a shit about putting out quality stuff. It's not always my thing." But he's talented and he's hardworking and yeah. I really appreciate what he does. I think 10% of it is my thing. A lot of it is not my thing, but I'm interested in it. But he's also like a lecturer and he has a he has a book or two on Amazon. He's like, if you like academic YouTubers, he's, yeah. he's a good one. Yeah, he's super academic. But sometimes I have like a bit of trouble knowing what he's actually talking about. Because he has all the sources, but not the actual like source of like what the subject the show he is he's talking about because i don't know if it's a manga or water if he's just talking about like some sort of weird genre but i i, I just found his channel very interesting i think if you're just looking for something a bit different because like he, he's his channel isn't that big no, he's been doing, yeah. I, I, but he's been he's, doing it for ages? But, like, he does very niche stuff and talks about it in a very academic way. I, I don't think that, I don't think he's someone who's, like, trying to grow his channels for a big, and I respect that about him. Because yeah, not yeah. every channel needs to be, like, hundreds of thousands or whatever. Yeah, like, he's super passionate about it, which I yeah, think is cool. totally. Real cool series on uh, post-apocalypse imagery in manga and anime. I haven't watched those yet. It's good. It's cool. good. Um, mine is, Lindsay Ellis has a new video. Just watched it. It's the, the Hobbit. Hobbit one. Yeah, that's yeah. brilliant. I'm so excited. So good. Yeah. It's oh. So good. And the ending's really cute. She's going on holiday, and I hope she has a great time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she's so cool. She's a little star. Because she, she used to be called the Nostalgia, nostalgia chick, chick, yeah. chick, but now she just goes by her name. Which that is really Lindsay cool. Ellis is so much better than Nostalgia Chick. Yeah. I, I, Look, I, branding's hard. Branding is super hard. Yeah, it is. I don't know. I mean, obviously, I'm pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's because, like, my girlfriend and Neil do all your art. The Super Eye Patch Wolf character <laughs> is more than just art, Brian. Yeah, it's it's an identity. Yeah? It's a persona. I knew this was going to get weird! <laughs> I was like, oh, Neve's defending me. Oh, Neve's defending me. Oh, no. <laughs> And other than that, years and years have a new single out, and there's some really great dancing Guys, thank in it. you so much for joining us tonight. It's been, I think it's been a particularly good episode. I had a really good time this one. I, I know I did, and mm -hmm. we don't need to talk about what Neve just said there. No. She didn't say anything. She talked about, she made the persona joke, and then was silent for like nine seconds. <laughs> Weird. Um, guys, thank you so much again for joining us, and we will see you in the next one. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bananas in pajamas are coming down the stairs. Bananas in pajamas are coming down in pairs. Bananas in pajamas are chasing teddy bears. Cause on Tuesdays they all try to catch.
chào bạn